There's John. Hi, John. Here I am. Hello, check John. My, says check my speaker, but I think my speaker's working just fine. Yes. I can hear you. Hello, John. Good evening. Good evening. Dean Wheeler, how are you? I see you on there. We got 70. John? Hey, <clears throat> pleasure. Let me get up my chat here. Where's my chat? Oh, come on. You know, I swear every now and then, just for fun, they change these icons and everything to um, to make it more, I don't know, to make it new and improved. It certainly makes it new, rarely makes it improved. So anyway, I think I'm, I think I'm here. And it's seven o'clock. Oh my gosh, we almost always have some kind of you know, ramp up, you know, where we're all saying hi. So I'll have to stop this evening so everybody can uh, can say good, um, goodbye when, when that time comes. So good evening, everybody. Thanks for being on. We got 91 people on so far. We'll see how many more people we get on as time goes on. I expect our official counter uh, will be on tonight, Doug Clark. Oh, I told him I was going to, I'll have to drop away and grab a, one of my pith helmets because he's got time to drop away and grab one of his, I'm gonna have a harder time. So I'm gonna start off by saying I tried um, uh, to get my uh, my buddy to come on with the SU carburetor stuff, but I'm not sure that that's gonna work tonight. Um, but I do have some carburetor stuff myself that we can talk about. It's, for some of you, it's old, old news and it's a rehash and for other people, it's like, oh my gosh, brand new and other people like thanks for showing it again because first time around I, I I really didn't really didn't get it but anyway I want to I want to open up tonight and just talk about how it all works most of you have been on, on here before um, this is a two-hour session it's a zoom session it's a participatory session in that you can break in and and make comments from time to time We've got some people make lots of comments, lots of people lie way, way back and never say a thing and just listen. Um, if you want to make a comment, um, all you have to do is unmute yourself, which is down on the lower, on my computer, at least, it's in the lower uh, left-hand side of my computer screen, and I can click on it and it says unmute, and then you unmute, and then when you're all done talking, you can mute yourself again. Or if you stay on unmute, you only have to press the space bar for as long as you're speaking and then let go and bingo, you're, you're muted again. Now I've got a very powerful button here. I've got a mute all, that means everybody but me. And um, so I, I can mute everybody, which I do from time to time because there's always background noise, either hands and dishes in the kitchen or a phone ringing or a barking dog or a grandchild showing grandpa how to how to operate the, the computer. You know when you hear it, and uh, I, it's just the way it is. It's not because I don't like you, but I love to hit that mute all button. It keeps everything silent. But at any time, if you want to break in and say, hey, you know, um, what about this? Or, you know, I mean, something relevant. I mean, help me out. And and I want to say something, then then like, yeah, let's let's go for it. And you can add something to the discussion rather than raising your hand, because I can only see uh, five, so I can only see 25 people at a time. And, and uh, here goes that mute all button, see? I told you I was gonna use it. And um, anyway, I can only see 25 little screens at one time, and one of those is me, so I can only see 24 of 129 people so far. So that's, that's, um, that's the way it is to use that mute all button. If you've got a question, put it in chat pretty soon. Sometimes, rarely, sometimes we get all the way through the chat. Uh, sometimes we don't, it just depends. I can push it up to 9.30, but beyond that, I'm pretty well done talking. And, and uh, those who are lying in the background, not saying much have already gone to sleep. I do take these sessions, not frequently, but in batches, I probably got four to do and put them up on YouTube. Um, so in the next, the next, next time I send out a, um, 
a newsletter, a, an email, I'll put something in there about how to access these. But it's like kind of like watching a ball game the day afterwards. I mean, there's no difference if you're watching it on your television set. I mean, you know, what difference does it make if you're watching it live or you're watching the day after? But day after is just old news, you know? So it's hard, hard to watch these on YouTube. Unless you want to watch yourself talk or something, you know, that, that would be fun. The way that I'm able to afford to do these is through your contributions. So here comes the pitch. Um, I've, got a, I've got a website, universitymotorsltd.com. Many of you know where that is and you know where my PayPal button is in the upper right hand corner that says something catchy like help John afford his retirement. You can press the PayPal button and uh, some people some people have me on a, on a, on a month by month uh, $2 a month, and some people make very, very generous uh, d donations um, when they feel like it. So I, I, uh, I would encourage you to go there. I, ha I do have costs associated with this. I've got to pay my constant contact fees. I got to pay my YouTube, not, not my YouTube, um, but what are we on? Zoom. I got to pay my Zoom fees. I got to pay insurance, insurance, but you know, the, you know, everybody's got those lawyers that you know, come on TV just after me, you know, are you afraid? Are you afraid you're going to be afraid? Call me anyway. Uh, so I got to pay insurance too. So anyway, all of that, all of that adds up to a little something and then I make something off these too. So thank you. And I got to pay my, I got to pay my assistant, Marty. Um, I just paid her today. We're, we're up and going on a new website. Um, so we'll have the old website in place, but we're starting a really, really powerful very informative new website with all kinds of stuff on it that's fresh and easy, uh, but it's a, it'll be a subscription website. So it's not very much money, but it's a subscription website and that'll help me pay Marty who does most of the work. I've written most everything that goes up onto it, but she's the one who's organized it and I got to pay her to, to, to do it. So anyway, more, more about that later. I want to thank the people. Let me get my piece of paper here papers um, uh, and thank the people who have made donations uh, and in no particular order uh, since our last Zoom session. Those people include Sean English, Doug Clark, our counter, Dan Svensson, Elliot Katz, Bobo Tanner from Nashville, Royd Roberts, Judson Chapin, David Basili, Wayne Peterson, Dan McGovern, John Erzin, Sandy Bransky, John Uhas, Preston Morgan, Jim Nyberg, Dean Wheeler, thank you, Dean, Al Caracas, Bob Meyer, Tim Ross, Tom Starkweather, Alan Batchelder, who is the registrar for all the magnets, Barto Lehman, George Gardner, Robert Lord, Tony Shoviak from the greater Toledo area, Bill Weekly from around Ann Arbor, Tom Banks, and Mark McCann. So thank you all very, very much for making those contributions. I do truly appreciate it. Now, I'm gonna do some numbers now. Um, my, constant, my constant contact letter that I sent out yesterday, I didn't look to see how many got kicked back. There's always some. There's always some unsubscribes, and there's always some that don't get through because it says mailbox is full, account suspended. Whose account would be suspended? Why is that? What does that even mean? Maybe you no longer work there. I don't know. Anyway, the number is 5,843. So that number continues to climb. It's really nice um, that we're able to contact so many people on just a simple email. Back in the day when our mailing list at University Motors was about 5,000, we did two massive mailers every year. So I'd have 5,000 envelopes printed, all the text printed and, and um, folded, but then as a family, the six of us, not all six, not all the time, but Caroline would rent a whole bunch of movies for a weekend, 
and we would collate, stuff, seal, address, stamp, and sort those 5,000 mailers. Now I can sit down and you can tell how quickly I do it sometimes because there's typos and stuff in it. There are always typos in, the, in those big mailers too, but I can get the whole thing done within 45 minutes now on constant contact. It's just a dream. My YouTube subscriptions, we were, I was going for the big 10 million. Oh boy, you know, right up there with Britney Spears. And I hit that in September and now it's 10 million, 102,000. So thank you very much for everyone who watches the YouTube videos because I get a little something off, not much. I mean, like a hundredth of a cent or I don't know, something per view, but 10 million times anything is something. Um, we have 24, thousand over 24,000 uh, YouTube subscribers. So I don't know if that means that you get an email. I don't know how that works or a notification. Um, every time I put up a new video, which isn't very often, um, I keep saying I'm going to do it. Um, so I'll say it again, you know, first of the year, we're going to start putting up some more YouTube videos. Facebook, Marty's been doing a really great job with that. And we have over 5,000 followers on our Facebook page, University Motors. She's always, you know, it's always like, show, you know, show me your new car. Show me, you know, what did you do with your, your vehicle and everything? And then I looked on MG Experience and I, I, uh, today, and I just thought, well, I wonder how often uh, University Motors, my name or something occurred, occurred in the last month. You know, that's, that's a number. And that was 20 times. Now in the summertime, that can get up to over 100, but there isn't quite, quite so much activity on MG Experience during the winter. I want to talk about uh, the American MGB Association. Um, the American MGB Association was the first MGB club back in the day, um, in the early days, 1965. Dick Knudsen and Frank Churchill started the New England MGT register. Prior to that, there were MG car club centers around the United States. And those that hold the longevity titles include Denver, Washington, DC, and Western New York. So the MG car club centers have been scattered throughout the United States since the 1950s. Those, a lot of those morphed into the SCCA. But starting in 1965, Dick Knudsen started this, this uh, register for um, T-type MGs. And then uh, in the 70s, three more were started. The American MGB Association for MGBs, NAMGAR, the North American MGA Register, started by Rankenberger and John Wright in the Washington DC area. And Tom Bascarino started the American MGC register. And those, those are the clubs that were operational. Um, around 1990, 1989, a group of us broke away from the AMGBA and started the North American MGB register. And that continues today with uh, over 2000 members. Um, coast to coast. And one member from Mexico, I don't know whether he's on tonight or not, but anyway. Um, so the AMGBA continued to operate. Um, they sent out their bi-monthly magazine, The Octagon. It was run out of Chicago by Frank, Chir uh, Frank Ocho and uh, Margie uh, Springer was the secretary. Bruce Majors was the treasurer. They did a couple of other clubs also besides the MGB club. And in October, I received uh, my Octagon magazine and Frank had written in there, this is the last print magazine that you're gonna get. From now on, it's gonna be email. Uh, just I, attrition, just things going on. Well, then about a week ago, Frank died unexpectedly. So um, I just, I, I just, I wanna, I just wanna make a, a general, a uh, call of condolence to Frank Ochel. I, I was um, a member I am of the American MGB Association. I was the technical chairman, go figure, you know. I was a technical chairman from about 1983 until, until we left. And when, when I left, 
um, my, my situation had improved. And so I became the founding chairman of the North American MGB register. So I just, I just wanted to say that. So the MG car club, the MG car club, which is the, which is the, the, uh, the gold standard in England. I mean, it's the, it's the Catholic church of the organization that started right at the factory with factory people. But then in the intervening years, um, personalities, um, things change. And so the uh, huge organization that runs parallel with that, not combined in any way, private operation, uh, is the MG Owners Club out of Svezi, Cambridgeshire. That's a huge organization with a nice, nice magazine. And there's the Oct Octagon Car Club, which also runs for T-types. And there may be some other clubs in England, I don't know. But the MG Car Club then um, had centers. And I just returned from Rochester at the Western New York um, center, the MG Car Club. I just spoke at their Christmas dinner. Uh, so anyway, the Western New York Center, Denver and Washington, D.C. I don't know who's older. I think Denver's older. And I'm not sure there's a toss up. It's months. I mean, we're not dealing years. We're dealing months between D.C. and Western New York. And that was the uh, domain of George Herschel for years and years and years. So there are other car clubs that have started up around. Here's the Chicagoland MG Club. It has no official, um, it, it's tied to itself and it does belong to the AMGBA and the North American MGB Register, so forth. So that's, a, that's an MG Club. And then we've got a, uh, here's one from the Reno, uh, the Reno uh, British Car Club. That's what a lot of people have gone to is the British, British car clubs, because even though you might might have at one point had a sticker on the back of your car that said, "I'd rather be driving my MG than pushing a Triumph," a lot of the a lot of the clubs have opened up. They've had to local clubs, to, and they'll accept Miata. They'll accept anybody. And then then there's clubs that are specific. Here we've got the Whitworth Nuts, you know, mo motoring club. But the mute. So here, I'll find it for you. Mute all. There we go. Now, now you're now you're muted. So there's a lot of car clubs all over, and there's a you know there's a whole history of each club, and some are national and in in, um, in scope, and some are local. I would encourage everyone to so first of all support your local um, British car club, MG club, whatever you have that's local. And uh, they, they're always desperate for a newsletter chairman or uh, someone to do activities. I mean, step up, you know, step up and, and do stuff. Judd talk, talks to us all the time about the trips that they take around, around South Carolina. I don't know if that's an official club or not, but um, anyway, they're, they're, all, um, they're all worth belonging to. There's power in numbers. And because there are efficiencies in scale, um, belonging to a club and supporting a club, by membership and by your donation of whether, whatever they take, $10 or $40. I just renewed the MG Car Club England. I think it's up to 50, 60 bucks now to get their magazine. Um, and that's what you do get. That's what most members get is a magazine. Um, and and some, some people don't participate at all, but it's nice to get the magazine and read. Some magazines are better than others, but the magazines all depend on your participation and you're sending in articles and, and, and you're stepping up and offering to help out the various clubs. So anyway, that's a rant, I guess, about the club and the condolence to the family and friends of Frank Ochel. Um, Richard Miller ran the MG Drivers Club out of New Jersey from 1996 until about two years, one year ago, when he stopped doing a print of his club, it was uh, more regional probably in, in scope, but it, it, you, you could, if you were from California, you could belong to, um, and they'd have an annual event and a very nice newsletter. That's where I kept up with all the modern MG news was through Richard Miller's organization, but he too has stepped back down a, a little bit, one man show. Um, and although he had other people who helped him, certainly with articles and, and uh, Rob Medinsky, 
whose name comes up over and over here for distributors, but he was the tech guy there. So anyway, enough about that. So I wanna talk a little bit about SU carburetors and then we'll get into the chat section. So the SU carburetor, its function is to turn gasoline from a liquid into a gas. There's two ways that you can change a liquid into a gas, two ways that are popular. One is to boil it and one is to evaporate it. So if you go to a, a, a sugar shack, a maple sugar shack, you usually will see both methods in, in operation. Great big boiler and they're, and they're bo boiling, uh, boiling stuff away, evaporating the, the, uh, the water out of the maple syrup. And then if they're really cool, they've got, um, they've got an evaporator, which uses vacuum, which some army units used, the Navy uses, that's how they turn seawater into, into drinkable potable water, is to evaporate it, distill it that way. So the SU carburetor changes the, changes the liquid gasoline into a vapor. But the question is how much vapor with how much air? That's the trick. And the stoichiometric um, um, balance between fuel and air is one part of fuel to 14 parts of air. And trying to keep that at that level through all these different combinations of starting and idling and accelerating and decelerating and running at 20 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour or 90 miles an hour, that's the function of this SU carburetor. The SU has got to be one of the simplest carburetors that there is. I mean, simpler carburetors exist on your on your lawnmower, old-fashioned lawnmowers, and they got a jet, but they only run between a couple of a couple of variations of speed. They don't have to run this incredible dif difference as we do between an idle of uh, 800, 600, 800, and, and uh, running up up to 5,500 um, if you're or if you're bold, maybe a little more. It is orange up there on the tachometer, so it means stay away. So the SU carburetor um, it has very few moving parts, very few indeed. It's got a butterfly, that's easy, that controls the amount of air that goes through it. All carburetors have that, even fuel injection has that. Then there's an air piston. That's what makes the SU different from all the other carburetors. There's an air piston that goes up and down and it's, it's how high it, it floats is a function of the amount of air going through the carburetor. So the carburetor, the air, the, the, the draw through there um, causes the air piston to rise. And how high it sits is a function of um, the, the airflow. And then the mechanical, the mechanical stuff that's going on too, the, the spring pressure that's on the air piston or the or the weight of the brass on the really early pistons. There's a tapered needle on the bottom of that, of that carburetor, and, and that tapered needle pulls out of a, out of a jet, pulls out of a jet, and, and um, the higher it pulls out, the greater the opening. So the higher, the higher the piston, then the more gasoline is able to get sucked into the, into the air as it, as it goes through. That's the magic. And how many needles, how many different needles are there for SU carburetors? I don't know, a thousand, you know, I don't know. You got a, you got a, a Rover, a Rover 2000, you've got a Volvo, you got, you know, you got a Mini, you got, I mean, there's all these different, different needles based on jet sizes and application. Only a couple of them are really good for your car. The best needle to use is the one that the factory described as being the proper needle in the beginning. Unless you've put a, um, a wide band oxygen sensor on your exhaust, some people have done that, and read the amount of, of, of oxygen that's coming back down through the, through the exhaust um, to, well, unburn gasoline to tell you, to tell you how much how much gasoline you still have available to burn, therefore, which, you know, which needle might be better. It's a, it's a big guessing game. 
and the and the guy that really knows what needle to use in which application is Joe Curto, C U R T O, JoeCurto.com. Uh, I can't remember the, the the exchange on his phone number, um, but the the last four digits are seven eight seven eight, which is S U S U. He's in um, Queens, New York. Nice guy. So the SU carburetor is just the greatest carburetor, but there's stuff that goes wrong with it. It wears, leaks air, drips gasoline, mixes the wrong amount of fuel with the air. You know, all those things can, can happen. Overflows, as the needles and seats get bad. I've got a little PowerPoint presentation. Let me see if I can, if I can make this work here. I'll have to have somebody probably come in. Oh, I don't even work here. Share screen. Okay. Now I'm going to go to SU Carburetors. Look at that. Share. Okay. Now we're going to we're going to try this. Try this. So I I got my SU Carburetors here. And I get to my slideshow, and uh, my next my next screen is the simplest carburetor that there is. Can you see this? Can can someone just speak up and say, yeah, you can yep. see it? Yep, we see yep. it. All right. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. I want to see it. Okay. All right. So here we've got the simplest carburetor, and the, the air is moving from the left to the right through a venturi, which is shown as a rectangle. And then there's a there's a float bowl off there on, on the left. Um, can you see my cursor? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. So there, so you got, you know, there's there's fuel sitting in this bowl over here. It's just like the back of your toilet. There's a there's a float in there and a and a and a valve. And with luck, the float stops the stops the fuel from coming in when there's enough fuel. Um, SU carburetors overflow, toilets will overflow. Um, air pressure pushes down on the gasoline in the float bowl and then pushes it out into the airflow. There is no such thing as vacuum. It's easier to talk about it. All there is is pressure, right? Just like there is no, um, there is no black, there's only light. Uh, there, there is no cold, there's only heat. So if we talk about pressure, um, we are speaking correctly, but um, as, the, as the pilots here will, will explain that so I sometimes it's easier to, to talk just in pressures and di pressure differentials. So the pressure at the venturi is a lot less than the air pressure pushing down on the gasoline in the flow bowl. So the gasoline goes into the airflow. So this carburetor works perfectly for a constant speed, constant load engine. You don't need anything else. This is great. It works perfect. What's the size of the venturi? What's the what's the size of the of the jet? Well, that's all determined on the on the 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 speed and the load. With our with our cars, of course, we've got different speeds. So the first thing we have to do is put in the throttle disc. Okay, now on the on the right hand side of this throttle disc, there's just a huge vacuum, a monster vacuum. It wants to pull it, the get the engine's running. All it wants to do is run faster. And that, that throttle disc uh, cuts down the amount of air that's going into the engine by a lot, okay? So that's our first moving part of the carburetor is this throttle disc. The next moving part is more complicated, and that's, that's the air piston. On the bottom of the air piston, there's some holes, and, and those holes move the vacuum up into this, this chamber Above, above the air piston. So the, the faster the air is going through the carburetor from left to right, the higher this piston moves and the more it pulls this tapered needle out of this, out of this uh, fixed jet. And the strength, of the, the strength of the spring, the size of the venturi, the size of the needle, all that is, is uh, set up and and there's one for a TD and one for a TF and one for a TD Mark II and one for an MGA and they all change. So my next slide, some of you have seen this before, is right at the point of acceleration, you have to you have to enrich in the mixture, just the way it is. 
all other carburetors have um, an, ex a, an accelerator pump and it shoots gasoline, just raw gasoline. It's just crude, nasty. Shoots raw gasoline into the throat, provides that extra boost of, of um, gasoline that's necessary, right at acceleration. And then when you level back off again, then everything's great. We don't have an accelerator pump. Instead, we've got a, we've got a, a damper on the inside of the dash pot. And that prohibits the air piston from moving up as quickly as it might once the throttle disc is open. So when the throttle disc is open very, very slowly, not much happens. But if we open it up suddenly, oh my gosh, that air piston would want to jump up. Because it wants to jump up, it's going to open the Venturi. Even though it pulls the tapered needle out of the jet, the vacuum at the, at the jet drops off so much that our mixture fails, our, our mixture gets too lean. So we restrict the upward movement of that air piston. So I'm always a fan of putting thick oil in the dash pot. Now, the engineers will tell you that 90 weight gear oil, which I suggest putting in there, is the same viscosity as 2050 motor oil. But feel it, look at it, drip it, it's thicker at least it's thicker at, at uh, ambient temperatures. So I like thick oil in there, not three-in-one oil, not SU oil. If you have to buy the little can that says SU oil, pour that stuff into the engine and put 90 weight in there, and then you've got that nice little blue bottle with the, with the uh, SU on it, you can drip it in. Any oil is better than no oil. 90 weight is better than any oil. When you go to start the car, you have to have a phenomenally rich mixture. So on all the cars up through the, on all the H, um, SUs up through HIF, you physically drop the jet. The jet drops here. It, it, there's some, something mechanical that draws it down, brass levers on the T-types or, or on the MGAs or the early bug eyes. Um, or a rotary spring and, and uh, a cam and stuff on the, on the HS carburetors, but the jet drops. And if that jet drops a quarter to three eighths of an inch, that's a long way. Um, if it drops that far, you can start it in the Arctic. <clears throat> the problem starting is that there's no airflow. I mean, there's just no airflow through here at all to speak of. You're spinning the engine over going round, round, round. I mean, what? What's the cubic feet per minute going through here? About zip. You hardly have anything in there. So, um, I mean, at, at, at running speed, at, at 3,600 3, RPM, running down, down the road, um, you can easily, that air is easily going through there at 60 miles an hour through the carburetor. There's such a volume of air going through there, but when you're starting, there's hardly any air going through. You still have to evaporate the gasoline. So you end up having to add a lot more gasoline than normal just to get enough into vapor. Now there's lots and lots and lots of little droplets that go through there and don't even, maybe they burn on the surface, but there's not enough time for them to, to, uh, to combust all the way through. So you're, you're spewing out a lot of unburned gasoline out the tailpipe right when you're choked and starting, which is why the government doesn't like carburetors and carburetors are no longer good and, and um, fuel injection is so much better, et cetera, et cetera. But um, if that jet drops, if that jet drops one quarter to three eighths of an inch, it'll start anywhere. And so if you're having trouble starting, pull the choke all the way out and look at those jets and just make sure, are they dropping? The HIFs use a very different type of enriching. They have a rotary valve that works when you turn the, um, when you pull the choke out and it draws gasoline right out of the float bowl into the airflow through another, uh, another circuit, uh, another, another um, set of drilled pass passageways. And there is a number 13 O-ring in that that fails. So the choke comes on when you don't put the choke on and the car can run phenomenally rich a real common, real common problem with the uh, um, HIF carburetors. 
Uh, lastly, just here's the, here's the designation. H1 carburetors are like bug eye carburetors. So they're one eighth of an inch over one inch. So the throat's one and an eighth. Um, an H2 carburetor is one uh, is two eighths of an inch over one inch. So that's an inch and a quarter. Find those on TCs, TDs, all midgets. H well, except the midget 1500. And H4 is four eighths of, of an inch over. So that's one and a half inches. Find that on the MGAs, the TD Mark IIs, TFs, uh, all the MGAs. H6s you would find on an MGC. Those are huge carburetors, um, very, very large. And then eights, H eights or H, I've got written HD here because they hardly ever occur in another, another configuration, but an HD eight is eight eighths of an inch. Those are two inch carburetors. Find those on, on uh, big, big engines, uh, 3,500, 4,000 cc engines, uh, Rolls Royce and, and uh, Bentleys and, and uh, uh, Healy's, some of the Healy's use them. So H is a designation for a horizontal carburetor. HS is, is a designation for horizontal short body, uh, which were introduced in 1962. HIF is horizontal integral float, which were introduced in 1972. And HDs, I don't know if anybody out, out here, how many, I can't see how many people got on right now. Um, um, the, the Mark III and Mark IV magnets had HD carburetors, go figure, you know, um, the, the uh, Farina magnets. Uh, anyway, that's just a, a quick course, a quick course on, Carburetors. Now let's see if I can get back. Let's see if I can escape out, out of this. And uh, uh, let's see. Uh, that's not what I want to do. Oh my gosh! How do I get back out of this? Oh my gosh! Uh, so stop sharing in uh, red. Um, hey, I recognize. I recognize your your accent. Um, Rodolfo, thanks. <laughs> stop share. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyway, so um, all carburetors respond to cleaning. Oh my gosh. I have a good friend lives in Peoria, Illinois, um, just polished up his suction chambers. He sandblasted them first. Sand is, is uh, like being intimate on a beach. Sand gets everywhere. So anyway, he thought they were clean. He polished them all up and everything. Turns out that the sand uh, was inside his carburetor and jammed up his air pistons so they could no longer move freely. So his, his car just wouldn't respond to accelerating and decelerating and tuning because the our Venturis were artificially held at a size that was unnatural, except in one particular place, which you don't end up with when you're tuning. So anyway, um, that's, that's good. Cleaning, cleaning the carburetors, cleaning inside the float bowls, Inside the suction chambers, that's always good. Putting 90 weight gear oil in them, that's nice. The needles and seats that are used on the H and the HS carburetors, uh, those should be Viton tipped. There's a couple different needles and seats. The original AUD 9096s were steel, um, but those don't, it, one tiny speck of dirt which comes out of the fuel tank, you can't help it. One tiny little speck of dirt will hold those open leaking and the carburetors will overflow. Then the gross jets, back when the gross family made them in Massachusetts or Connecticut or wherever they were, they were pretty good, but gasoline was different too. The more modern gross jets, which use two balls, it's an excellent concept, that they stick. Sometimes they'll stick closed and they'll stick open. Uh, usually you discover this um, after getting the car out after a period of time. The, be the better needles and seats absolutely are the new Viton tipped ones. And those Joe Curto's got those. Most everybody's got those in their kits now. So I'm not going to talk about tuning because I've already chewed up over half an hour of just chatting about the SU carburetors. But if you understand how they work, then... Tuning them is easier. If you got 
two carburetors, each carburetor has to do the same as the other. If you've got three carburetors, like on a Healy, or you know, you're all jazzed up and you got three carbs on your on your MGC, you've got to do a lot of fiddling and balancing to get the air flows the same and the mixture the same on, on each one. So I'm happy to, to entertain questions for a little bit about, about SUs, and then we'll go over to the chat section and or clubs or whatever I've talked about in my 40 minute monologue here. So you got some questions. John? Yes. On those gross nets, uh, when they first came out by the original uh, manufacturer, they were pretty good. And then later out, when they sold their the, the rights out of there, uh, the uh, ball on those gross nets were not perfectly round like the original factory did. They became oblong. They were just not manufactured very good. And that's why they've had the fall, uh, troubles with the gross net. Okay. We used to, Caroline, my late wife, used to write checks to Mrs. Gross, you know, back in the day. We bought them right from there, and they were excellent. But since then, since the family um, quit making them, yeah, you're right. They aren't, they aren't as good as they used to be. John? Yes, sir. Um, Lou Moon from Rockford, Illinois. Um, I bought a 1975 MGB and I had a different carburetor on it and I had a chance to get a couple of SUs so I changed it off right away. Did I do the right thing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You're, you're talking to a guy here who believes that Weber's are only made for grilling steaks. So um, yeah, ab absolutely. And, and the two carburetors are nominally better than the single Stromberg. Um, but a Stromberg carburetor still is still works on the same principles as the SU does. And when my uh, my associate, my buddy Carl Heidemann, tried single Strombergs against dual SUs on a dynamometer, I mean, you know, he changed the whole manifold. He got that whole original um, Stromberg manifold that comes forward and then goes back again. It's uh, it's the silliest thing to accommodate the catalytic converter. And when he changed that out for a pair of SUs, he might've got three horsepower about that from, from that change. So you don't do it, you, you don't do it because you get a better horsepower. You get it because working two SUs is better overall. It's easier starting, less trouble. Yeah, dual SUs are great, great. Hey, John. Yes. Gerald Dalton here. Yes, sir. Uh, where, where are you from? I was going to you, I spent a lot of years. I'm from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Okay. Um, I spent a lot of years in the motorcycle business. And just as, as if some of these guys have motorcycles, most of the bikes from the 80s until into the 2000s basically used a, a constant velocity carburetor, which is very, very similar to what you're talking about here. It works on the same exact principle. And one of the little things when I'd have, I'd have people in my, come in my, uh, uh, my shop here in my garage at home, and uh, uh, they, wanted to, they would ask, how does the carburetor work? How does it make the fuel go? So I used to take a straw, stick it in a glass of water, and then just take an air compressor and just blow across the top of it. And they would see, they would go, oh, it's sucking the water up and making a big mist cloud. And they go, no, it's making a low pressure and atmospheric pressure is pushing on the jar, forcing that water <laughs> back up too. So it, it took a little bit to get some understanding. Yeah, you're, these, you're having these to make them carburetors think. work in that same exact principle. Yes. Yeah, I, the, the motorcycle guys would come in sometimes to, to buy SUs to put, put them on and they'd always talk about them slides you know, and I, I was kind of shuddered, you know, those aren't slides, those are air pistons, but whatever you want to call them, you know, but yeah, that's right. <laughs> John, yeah. I, I'd like to ask you a question about a Seattle. Um, yes, sir. When I was a kid in the early 70s, there was a lot of time, let's, and this is getting to the 90 way oil and carburetor. Um, I've heard of hydraulic uh, oil, I've heard of automatic transmission fluid in carburetors. So can these carburetors be drained of what's in them and uh, 98 oil added to them? Sure, sure. You can, um, you, can use, you can use Gerald's straw technique, but you want a long straw. You don't want to suck too hard. 
<laughs> draw, draw the the old oil up out of there, or you can take the suction chamber off and pour, you know, take the air piston out, pour it out, or you can just take 90 weight if it's in a in a in a um uh if you got a spout uh, um geez, what am I trying to say here? Um a Hello, spout. Dan. A what? Oh, Dan. Yeah, and and uh, just stick it in there and glug 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 and force the old oil up and out, you know. So yes, yeah, and you know, and, and people say, oh, but my workshop manual says use engine oil. My buddy says use ATF. Volvos use ATF. Maybe it's colder in in Sweden. I don't know. Um, but however, you, you get it out of there, and, and if you just fill it up, if you just fill it up with ninety weight and take the damper. And go up and down. It'll mix the existing oil, which is about one third of the what the the, the uh, dash pot holds, and then mix it up with a ninety weight. Then you get a mix of ninety weight in the thinner oil, and and two thirds of it's going to piss out real fast. You rev it up, and those pistons come out, and it squirts the oil out the top. You want to have a rag up there, unless you don't mind your linkage and stuff getting oiled. I saw a brake fluid in those once. And um, at least once, and on the underside of the bonnet, there was two streaks where, where the paint had been had been lifted because somebody had overfilled them, put too much brake fluid in them, and then when they accelerated, it squirted the brake fluid out on the underside of the bonnet. So any anything in there is better than nothing, and um, uh, <laughs> oil is better than than nothing, and ninety weight is better than the oil. And why ninety? Why thick oil? Because the the dash pot's got a certain diameter, right? In the in the in the the um, the damper has a certain diameter, and those those run real close to each other. What we are making in there is a hydraulic valve. So over the course of the past, well, I don't know when's the last time they used them. Seventy four. I can't do do the math. That's twenty six and twenty two forty forty some odd years ago. Forty six years ago. Is that even possible? Um, the um, the dirt dirt is collected in that in that on that brass piston and it's abraded the steel the inside of the steel dash pot so the diameter has gotten larger so now the 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 valve which is still the same size is working in a in a hole that's too big in diameter and the oil rushes around the outside so it doesn't it doesn't stop the upward movement of those pistons as much as it should so i'm i'm telling you to use the thicker oil to account for where i mean how many times have those carburetors gone up and down 30 300 3000 30000 300000 3 million a lot a lot. Every time they've gone up and down, it's worn those steel pistons just a little tiny bit. The inside, I mean, worn the inside of that steel chamber. So, however, we can get it in there. Hey, John. Yes, sir. Fred, you're yeah. here. I, you know, I emailed you twice. Well, I, I saw your email. I thought we were going to have a call. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fred is the SU guy. I want to, I, I want, I don't know how to share a screen with Fred. But I want Fred to talk about SU carburetors. So we're gonna we're gonna change our, our format here a little bit and and go over to Fred. So um, Fred. Well, I think what I'm gonna do is maybe talk a little bit about um, just a video, not not sharing my screen, but showing my video with my face and showing some parts and things. So maybe the camera will pick that up okay. best. But when we're talking about the dash pots and the oil. Um, I wanted to ask you what your the symptoms were when it was out of oil. You know, I've experienced it. I thought maybe you could, could describe it or I can describe it. But if your dash pots are out of oil, you get a, a huge hesitation every time you try and stomp on the throttle. It's, it's running way too lean because the piston flies up. And so you don't get any, any acceleration until it catches up with the airflow. Is that your experience? Absolutely. Yeah. And interestingly, downdraft Weber's, uh, like Lewis uh, suggested maybe he had on his carburetor, um, those at idle, the gasoline falls out of suspension, puddles on the inside of the intake manifold, and when you stomp on the, on the throttle to take off, 
it stumbles and, and, and fails. Yeah. Not because it's too lean, but because it's too rich until it catches up with itself. Right. And also the, the uh, at least the uh, downdraft webbers are really persnickety with that idle and uh, cut, cut over adjustment so that it doesn't stumble when you accelerate. There, there's a sweet spot there, but I've never been able to find it. It's because the gasoline falls out of suspension. But, yeah. but Fred, Fred did a wonderful, wonderful. Um, gosh, we ought to. We, we really ought to do this. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, right. I mean, I can share my screen, but Please. I don't. I don't have my presentation up ready to. Oh, present. okay. But I thought I, I'd share some other. Yes, please do. Visual stuff. So one thing is, I, I found this carburetor, and I thought I'd demonstrate the the wear in the throttle shaft. Uh, Moss has a a little video, not a video, a drawing of when do you have um, throttle shaft wear? When's the time to rebuild it? So this one, I don't know if you can see it, but you can see this uh, shaft wobbling. Can you see that? Yes. So, so that's that's like the ten percent that Moss shows in their illustration, saying if you have that much wear, you need to uh, rebuild your carburetor and reshaft it. Now, most people will say if you're going to reshaft a carburetor, you should rebush it too. But that's it. All depends. If you want to do it absolutely, absolutely right, yes, you want to rebush it too. But the bushings are much. Um, stronger than the shaft the brass shaft itself these are centered bushings so they don't wear nearly as much as the shaft itself so you can many times get by with just replacing the shaft hey fred yep paul keithan uh, Hi, paul. What, what what are the symptoms when you have a worn shaft on the carburetor well first of all you're going to be sucking a lot of extra air uh, in that shaft particularly when it opens it's not always um, sucking air at, in the idle position, but as soon as it opens, that's when you start getting the wear. At, at idle position, there's no there's no movement, but when it opens up, that's when there's pressure on that shaft, and that's when you get the wear on that shaft. So when, it, when it's open, that's when it's sucking a lot more air uh, in past that uh, throttle plate. So you're just changing there's, the mixture somewhat. Yes. There's there's two two things that I've noticed. One is that the idle is not consistent. So you take your foot off the gas and sometimes it idles at 1100 and the next time it idles at 700 and the next time it's 900 and you go, wow, well, yeah. what's going on here? The way to find if it's leaking is to spray carburetor cleaner yeah. through the tube, through that 90,000th tube that comes with the, with the carburetor cleaner, spray that around the, the shaft while the car is idling. Now, there, you, you, there's always a leak there, always a leak. But usually, if it's good carburetor cleaner, it's barely noticeable. It'll change the RPM just a little tiny bit. But if you can get the car to speed up a lot or kill one or the other, depends on how your carbs are adjusted and what kind of carburetor cleaner you're, you're using. Um, um, if you can get it to change a lot, hundreds of RPM, like bingo, it's a vacuum leak. So what happens is you adjust your carburetors to account for this extra air getting in at idle. So you might adjust the jet down an extra, I don't know, six, turn, uh, six flats, whole turn. Well, now when you're up at, at normal running speed, it's too rich because a leak a pinhole leak at, at 40 miles an hour it has no significance at all, but a pinhole leak at idle it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. I'll, back to you, Fred. So here, here's a, see if I can show that. You, I don't know if you can see right here, the big dip in the shaft. That's a really badly worn shaft right there. So these are these are I have a question expensive. For, I have a question for Fred or John about shaft sizes. Yes. What Fred, you helped me identify my carburetors on my 73 MG. They're actually very old. They're AUD 52. Yes. But what's the difference between standard size and oversized shafts? 
Well, um, is ten thousandths is basically the difference, and I would not recommend uh, oversizing your shafts, at least on the H carburetors, because you have to uh, remove a pin and have a, a throttle linkage on here, and it's very difficult to resize all of your bits to make that work. So I am I'm not a proponent for oversizing the H series carbs. The um, HS carbs, probably not as not so bad. You could probably oversize those without a problem because it's just a nut on, nut on the end to hold the linkage on. So that's a lot easier. But the H's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't oversize them. I don't know. What do you think, John? Um, I, I'm not, I'm no fan of oversized shafts at, at all because you end up boring all the way through it. Yeah. And then you get air leaking around the, around yeah. the outside of the throttle disc. So, so who would use them? They sell them on all these moss and other other vendors. Send uh, sell them. Who would use the oversize? Well, it's because it's cheaper. It's it, you you buy the reamer, the ten thousandths reamer, and it's a one step process. You ream the bushings ten thousandths larger, and then you use the then you use the oversized throttle shafts to put in bushings. You've got to have um, an you have to have a reamer, two reamers, one to ream the body a shouldered mandrel to drive in the bushing, another reamer to ream the inside the in, inside of the, of the throttle shafts. It's just easier at home to, to do it. It's just an option, not one that, you know, I mean, it's like brazing body work. No, I, and why would you braze? Um, but it's an option, you know? Yeah. So. Well, I, so, I would, if you're gonna, if you're going to rebuild your carburetors, um, you know, rebushing is the correct way to do it. You can, as I say, just put in new shafts, and a lot of times that'll take up 99% of the wear. But if it doesn't, then you have to go with new bushings. Fred, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Um, um, on the on those carburetors, when that shaft gets worn, do they stick, or do you you notice more um, stumbling problems than you do uh, drivability? Reason. But well, I say, you, I say you that is notice, I just replaced the throttle body on my dad's work. Yeah, you probably wouldn't notice a stumbling um, unless it's really, really badly worn. As uh, John pointed out, a lot of people just keep adjusting their their uh, idle until the, the problems go away, but then it's not running right at higher speed and that sort of thing. So, you know, people right, work there, around it, but there's a lot of different options. The reason I say that is I just recently replaced the throttle body on my dad's Corvette. Now, granted, we're talking fuel injection, which will compensate for a lot of things, but I'm driving that thing one day and I, I'm going 54 mile an hour down the freeway with my foot off the, off the, the uh, gas pedal. And my, my dad's having it and he goes, yeah, I got to squirt that cable every once in a while. Well, I looked at it and the, the thing probably had an eighth of an inch play. So the throttle bodies were hanging up. Literally the blades were were uh, hanging up inside the uh, the throttle body, which yeah. replaced yeah, the throttle I, body. I've never, since seen they don't a, sell. I, I've never seen an SU uh, uh, throttle uh, disc hang up uh, from wear, but yeah, I, I would suppose figure, it's possible. <laughs> I would figure you'd have more drivability problems before you ever get got to that point. Like I say, with fuel injection, it's a little different story because the computer just keeps making making things right until it's absolutely yeah, yeah. too late. So. So this is, uh, I wanted to show you this little uh, inch and an eighth uh, H2 carburetor. This is from a MGTC. And this thing weighs like five pounds. It's made out of a, a zinc <laughs> alloy. And they changed this later in the TD to a, a aluminum alloy, which makes it much lighter. Exactly the same shape, but much lighter. But if you want originality, you want the zinc one for an MGTC. So that's what this is. John John and Fred, uh, Dale Brown from Windsor, Ontario, although I'm in British Columbia right now. Yeah. Just a real quick question that I haven't been able to figure out. On my 72 that has HIF uh, SUs, yes. my front carburetor, the, uh, the damper screw that hold, that pushes down the piston every once in a while pops out and I can tell because then the car doesn't run as smooth so yeah. I open the hood screw it down again I've tried reversing them 
it still happens on the front. I've tried putting uh, plumbers, Teflon tape around it, tightening it as hard as I can get, but it still pops out once in a while. What's causing that? Do you know? Well, it no. could be worn. It could be worn threads on the uh, on the, the dash front. pot. Um, you'd have to look at your threads and see how they look. Um, Maybe that'd be very unusual. Um, but if you switched them, they're both just like plastic threads. So, yes. Yes. You know, the other thing is there's a washer on the bottom side of that um, damper. Yes. You might be able to just put a new fiber washer underneath there, and that'll help it. Seal oh, down. so it'll go down a little tighter. Yeah. Down for further down. So, okay, thank uh, you. Um, I, I take the washer off altogether um, so that you, you get another yeah. another turner turn or two of the, that's a real fine thread. That's a British standard brass thread, 26 okay. threads per inch. So, um, is, but if you can take it off one, take it off the other. Sure. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, that'll another do thing, it. Another thing Next is, spring as, when I try it, I'll let you know. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> as John had pointed out on those uh, on those dampers, they have a little brass uh, a plunger inside, a little piston. And yes. on um, the MGA 1600 and the MGB carburetors, they made that little piston shorter, I guess for, for oil flow or whatever uh, in that chamber. The earlier ones, the 1500 uh, carbs had a longer uh, piston. So you can actually, there's just a little circlip on there you can actually put longer pistons into your dash pot dampers if you want to help with that oil flow flowing past that little plunger uh, to compensate for the wear that John was talking about inside there. I've never done that, but it's just a possibility of maybe making it flow a little bit differently. The um, thanks. Another thing when you're when you're rebuilding carburetors. You have two dash pots if you have uh, dual carbs. You know most of most of our MGs have dual carbs. Some of the early ones had a single carb, like uh, I think maybe the YTs maybe had a single carb, or maybe the early YA, or something. Y, YA had the single carb. Yeah. So anyway, when you have dual carbs, you want them to be very close to each other in terms of their flow. So these these are matched at the factory with the, between the piston and the 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 suction chamber. So what I've done is I've, uh, Joe Curdle shows this, and I think John does this on one of his videos too. He puts tape over the little holes in the bottom of the pistons, and then you do a drop test and see how long it takes for them to drop. They should be about seven seconds, you know, pretty close to each other. You want them to be kind of synchronized. So that's one of the things you want to check when you uh, rebuild your carburetors, is to check how, uh, how those pistons flow. Hi, Fred. Yeah. This is Eric in Round Rock, Texas. Um, had a question about the pistons there. Uh, I have HIFs, and on one of them, I can't remember which one, if, if you put your finger in there and lift the piston all the way up, on one of them, it sticks. On the other one, you can lift it all the way up, let it go, and it drops. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I had that on a previous MG, and a friend of mine had that on his. He, he pulled up at my house and he said, boy, my car is running really bad. And I undid the little bit, uh, little damper. Yeah. And yeah, and you could see it. And you just push it and it, it dropped the piston and everything's fine. I've never had problems with my 72 because it's right at the very top. Is that is yeah. that a concern? And is there anything I can do about that? Because I worry about the close tolerances. I don't want to mess up something, you know, well, I mean, it, it never hurts to take your uh, chambers off, take the pistons out, clean everything inside with very mild soap and, and mm -hmm. water, whatever. You know, don't use any abrasives or anything in there, but clean it all off, put it back together again, and then give it a drop test. Like when you, when you lift the piston, you should be able to hear a clunk. I don't know if you can hear that. Mm -hmm. When it comes down, it should drop nice and slowly and, and clunk when it comes down and it shouldn't stick all the way up. I mean, the the sticking all the way up, you might get stuck that way at full throttle, but not many people drive at full throttle. So Yeah, I haven't, I haven't had that issue. I had it on my previous MG one time. Uh, on this one, I haven't. So I just didn't know if it should be a concern or if there's any way to address yeah. it. Eric, I'll, I'll weigh in here. So you know, you take the suction chambers off, 
and uh, the suction chamber and the, <laughs> and the and the piston off and and push the piston all the way up in there and physically turn it around. And if it's hitting up in there, if the piston is is hitting the aluminum up in there because the suction chamber's been dropped, probably mm -hmm. something like that, then despite um, what Fred told you about being so careful and not using anything abrasive, go up in there with a piece of scotch bright or 600 paper and rub at the suction chamber where it's shiny already uh -huh. and then and then clean it and keep doing that until it, it yeah, because they should move up and down. You should be able to push them home. I love the British, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> the British, push them home and let go of them and have them, have them drop. Um, without you know, with, with, you should be able to yeah. put them all the way in there and spin them. You know, they should, but the clearance between the 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 outside diameter of the air piston and the inside diameter of the suction chambers, I don't know. Fred's probably measured it. I never have, but <laughs> it's. I mean, it's not. It's not even a piece of of the thinnest notebook paper there is. I mean, it's tight. Which well, that's, is, which that's is why I was hesitant to. Do anything aggressive. It's way up there. You're going to make any difference. Yeah. Well, as, you know? as, as a friend of mine says, if it's broken, you can't hurt it. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so take it, Can take I it chime away. in for a second? Yeah. Um, only because I've ran into this exact same problem. And again, it's actually picked it up from uh, something that had been mentioned online here. Um, my carbs were running really bad. The guy who rebuilt this car years ago did a terrible job and i've been just trying to fix things that i've been going but uh i was having a lot of carburetor problems i still have a couple to fix like the shafts but uh, mine were sticking pretty bad and i think it was john um i think it was one of his videos i watched one time that suggested just for craps and giggles i went ahead and switched the suction chambers mine were i had one that was sticking really bad and i switched the, the suction chambers and they work like a charm now Ah, okay. So somebody had taken them apart at some time, got them reversed. They're a match set. So yeah, fix the problem. And I, I know John was the one, I, I know it was one of his videos I picked that up on. So yeah, they 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 are match sets, but they do get mixed up over the over all these years. So yes, yeah. you can try switching them back and forth. Just kind of keep track of what you're doing. So you can always put it back to where it was before if you need to. Right. And as John points out. Um, I, I have seen one, I sent a set of carb off, carbs off to somebody, they returned them, and there's a big dent in one of those uh, chambers, and you could see where it was scratching, and I was able to take some um, uh, emery cloth and just, mm -hmm. just polish that one little spot, and just kept polishing and polishing that one spot, and it finally did start moving freely. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. So you, you can't, you know, so you in the do that all the time you just want to be really careful about cleaning the inside of there right but if it if it's if it's sticking you can you can clean it in the um in the workshop manual or a supplement they ask you to to cover up the air holes on the bottom of the air piston and push them all the way up to the top in the in the, the suction chambers and and let them drop so the only way they're dropping is the air that's getting between the, the outside diameter of the air piston and the inside diameter of the suction chamber, and they should both drop at the same rate. And anytime you do a tune-up, you must do that. So you end up with one dropping at two seconds, one, one dropping at nine, and you switch them and one drops at four and one drops at five. Yeah, I mean, you're not, what are you gonna do? You're gonna leave them that way. You leave them the closest yeah. as, as you can get them. Yeah. yeah, you want them to be as even as you can can get them uh, thank you another, another thing about airflow is on the on the uh hs carbs or h carbs see these two holes here these came in about 1955 uh on the t, uh, 54 on the tf and air comes through these holes and comes into these holes in the top of the chamber underneath the, the bottom of the suction chamber I've seen a lot of carburetors that they've been clogged up from a bug getting in there and building like a nest in there. So if you have a car that's been sitting around for a while, always make sure these holes are cleaned out and you get airflow up into the chamber uh, on these. Of course, you're, you, if you're gonna clean the carburetors, you're gonna find that anyway, but that's just something to check. And also there's a gasket that goes on here when you put your air filters on, make sure you got these holes clear 
because if you put the gasket on the upside down, you block those holes and it affects how it runs. All right. Another thing I wanted to point out is the way I adjust my initial richness is with a dial caliper. I use the depth gauge, which is on the bottom here, and put it into the carb on the, the jet. And I measure that distance. Right now I've got uh, 95 thousandths. So I, I set this at 60 thousandths, between 60 and 70 thousandths as my initial setting. When I put my carburetor together, I found on most MGs between 60 and 70 thousandths is perfect, maybe a tad bit rich, but they run great that way. They, in fact, your engine will run a little bit cooler if you run it just a tad rich. I don't know if John, you want to comment on that? Um, when I when I do them, I I turn them both <laughs> three full turns down, so that when you start it, um, you don't have to use you don't have to fiddle with the choke. They're 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 half yeah. choked. Well, that's and that is all flats, right? As a, um, three full turns would be eighteen flats, right? Eighteen. Okay. Yeah. So three full turns down. And uh, I know uh, Dave Brown um, suggests that, and you su suggest that, and I just go, well, you're going to have to adjust it anyway, and you got to get it running when it's cold. So rather than fool around with a choke and everything, just crank it down three, three full turns, start it up, and as it's warming up, you keep cranking them up until it, until it, you can listen to it. Of course, I'm experienced. I, you know, I, I've, I've done this a lot. You know, I can listen to it and go oh my gosh it's still way too rich and you keep cranking it up and and then once it's it's warm because you can't adjust the, the, the carburetors until the engine is at operating temperature but that shouldn't take any more than about three three or four minutes um but during that time you keep cranking it up and then and wherever they end end up they ever end up but you say 90 80 80 70 to eighty thousand between 60 correct. and 70 between 60 and 70 thousand. 60 and 70. And of course, that depends on the float level in the carburetors. That depends yeah. that the floats are set correct. Right. So speaking of uh, setting the floats correctly, I believe the book says uh, 7 sixteenths. You can take a drill bit or a, a piece of rod, or whatever. But the you know this handy dandy kit from SU has a flattened piece. This is 7 sixteenths for adjusting your float bowls, your float uh, levels. So that's that's one of one of the aspects of this. This is also for balancing your carbs. I, I, used, I used to use this all the time. And I've also used you know the, the unison um, to match them up. But I have a, a new method now. I'll, I'll show it to you in a second. But before that, I want to show you, before you do all these adjustments, when you're putting your carb together, you have a, a centering device this tool, again, this, this kit comes with a centering device, has a little piece like this that goes on the end of this tube. And you put this down through your empty dash pot down through there to center your uh, jet. When you're reassembling, before you tighten up this bottom nut right here. And that's how that's how you center it. But what I use is this handy dandy tool from Moss. I'm sure there's other people that supply it. If you put your put your chamber on there, and you just shove that down so that your jet comes all the way out. Tighten that up, and then it's centered. A lot of people kind of hit and miss, kind of go back and forth and back and forth and adjust it and adjust it and they finally get it right, but having the right tool to do it makes it really easy. It's a it's a handy tool, a handy tool to have, absolutely. Yeah. But as I say, this this kit for like 30 bucks comes with th this tool. And as I say, I since I have this handy dandy one, I don't use this one, but this one should do the trick as well. If you got a triple carburetor car, that's what this is for. That thing's pretty handy. That thing's pretty <laughs> handy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So um, something else, we'll go back to assembling this thing. Uh, 
and I got my got my stuff stuck in here. So he, while he's struggling with that, remember there are different air pistons for different carburetors, and there's a there's a slot on the side of the air piston that aligns it correctly because it can't just sit in any any rotation. There are two breather holes on the on the right. back side of the air piston, and those have to have to be at, at the at the the. Uh, um, Backside of the of the of the air of the air movement. Um, <clears throat> there are also two suction chambers. One's ventilated and one's non-ventilated. And when you so we used to see the cars come in, you'd see an HIF carburetor, an H, a sixty-four, a seventy-four MGB come in, and one one suction chamber would be from a fifteen hundred MGA with with dustless carburetors. Uh, with this extra hole drilled through the boss um, because somebody had, had was buffing up the original ones and it banged on the floor and dented it so they just grabbed one off an MGA and you cannot match and they they you can't use them like that you have to <laughs> this piece right here uh, yeah. on the on the 1500s has a drilling through there to allow air in there so in the cap the damper cap is solid on the 1600s and all the MGBs. This is not drilled through, and the solid the cap has a hole in it to allow the the air pressure to get in there. So you can't mix and match them. They all have to be the same. And you have to have you have to have one hole either either in the yes. damper or in the suction chamber. You can't have none, and you can't have have two. So what I wanted to show here is when you have the car all assembled, everything's uh, connected, you're ready to uh, do your synchronizing between the two carburetors. Again, you can use this kit with these little wires that go in here. Put that in there. You put your, your pointer on there and, and as it goes up and down, you just make sure they're equal, all right? So that's one way of doing it. Also with the unison, you can put this across the mouth and see the, the float going up and down, make sure they're the same. Now, John being the expert that he is, he just listens with a little hose and that, that's, <laughs> that's, too, that's too much flow, that one's not enough, you know, and he adjusts them. You know, I'm not, I, I can't hear anything, so I have to use these other methods. So here's another method. This is by a company called uh, British Tool Works. They take a dial gauge, they set it in there, and then as, as, the, uh, as the piston goes up and down, you can watch. So you synchronize them both at the same level to begin with, and then you can see their differences and adjust them so that they're both exactly at the same spot. They're pretty slick. What's that cost? What's that kit cost of two dial indicators and two? $83. Oh, that's pretty cheap. That's pretty cheap. Yeah. That's a whole lot less than I thought. Yeah. Still too much. <laughs> well, if you're doing a lot of carburetors like John and I do it, and, and working on cars, it's actually not that very expensive. If you only have one, it might two, be expensive. Two foot, two foot piece of half inch heater hose is only only seven <laughs> bucks now. So, <laughs> yeah. So um, that's about all I have uh, for show and tell. Now, Greg, I'm, can I ask you a question about the centering of the uh, jets? Yes. Once you, you can go ahead and center them over there, you hear the uh, piston drop. You got a nice metal click. Yeah. Correct? Yes. But when you go ahead, put it all together, you got everything set up there, you check them again. And unless you open that, uh, the uh, butterfly on there, that's the only time you can hear a click. With that butterfly closed, you can hear a clip. Is there a click? Is there something wrong there? You mean when the engine's off, 
You've got the carburetors. You've re just rebuild them. They're separate. You yeah. know, they're yeah. off the car. But I'm saying is you've got them set together and you've you've gone ahead and you've set, centered the, uh, uh, the, the, the needle yeah. and the jets on there. Everything is perfectly OK as long as you've got your butterfly open. You can let that piston drop. You'll hear a nice metal click on there where everything is perfect. But if you take the butterfly and you close the butterfly, you can't hear anything. It's just a dull thud. That's okay. Yeah, that's, that's okay. That's okay. As long as as long as it's metal. The whole point of it is that the top of the needle is is um, eighty nine and a half thousandths. And it's got to be concentric with a jet. It's got to be concentric with a jet. And if it is, it comes down the metal. Metal hits metal, but it doesn't hit metal. You got that piston back out? Can you show that little that little piece that sits out on the bottom of the air piston, Fred? The 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 um, later ones are plastic, so they don't really clunk like the like the earlier ones. You mean this piece? You mean where they put the needle in? No, next to it, the, that little brass piece. Right, right next between the pulling back up again. <laughs> which, which, oh, like no, a piston. No, the, 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 the bottom of the air piston. I'm looking for the bottom of the air piston. That's not not the suction chamber. The bottom of the air piston. Pull him out. Okay. So so uh, on my screen to the left of the needle is a little tiny piece of brass that sticks out of the bottom oh, of the uh, right. There. Right. right. Yeah. And that keeps the air Hello, piston. Pin. Yeah, right there. Yep. And that keeps the air piston from closing all the way. If it closed all the way, how would any air get through there? So um, that keeps it up just a little tiny bit. And on MGBs, that's no longer brass, that's plastic. Yeah. So it doesn't make as much of a noise as the earlier ones do. Something else to consider too is um, up until about 19. 67 the needle was fixed on mgas and mgbs from 68 on they put a little springy thing in there so that centering wasn't quite as big a deal because the the needle would move so it kind of self-centered but for the earlier carbs you really want to make sure that it's centered a question about centering the jet hey jack orkin in grayson georgia yeah, uh, I have the HS twos with the spring loaded needles. Yes. Is there any reason to worry about centering the jet with the spring loaded needles? As I say, um, as long as it's close, it's going to work just fine. But um, it's always a good idea to center it as as best you can. If you have one of these these tools, it'd be close enough. Or you know, just as you as John says, just do the drop test and make sure it goes all the way down. It should be should be fine. Okay. If you if you sight on it, if you just sight on it and and see that the jet is in the center of the top jet bearing, meaning that it bears the jet, um, that's that's good enough. They they cheapen them up a lot. They yeah. Can't really see. Yeah. Yeah, you you can you can see that as long as the as long as the jet sits in the center of, of that of that whole hole there, okay. you'll you'll be okay. Yeah. John, yeah, John Curta will comment that after a while with these spring loaded jets, they will wallow out a path on one side of the jet, yeah. Yeah. causing it to really it, it, replacement. I've never seen it, but certainly would happen because those yeah. needles are always biased toward the airflow and they, that's where they wear. Yeah. Well, it's a, the wear is so minuscule. I mean, you look at a piston, you look at the taper on that needle, and it's you know it changes you know by ten thousand less than than a than a ten thousandth as it goes along. So if you get an oblong, you know you get the jet supposed to be round, and if it ends up getting elongated, um, and you can't you can't see that. It, it, it'll almost, make a difference in the mixture. Absolutely, it's almost theoretical, but that's his point. Yeah, by the time your uh, throttle shafts are worn out, you're going to replace the needles anyway. So I wouldn't worry about it. Can we ask on something on the uh, for setting the uh, levers on there for the chokes so they both uh, yeah. move up and down uh, the same time? So on uh, depends on the carburetor. The the uh, H4s um, have a little uh, like almost an L hook 
with an adjustable nut it adjusts between the two levers uh, on the mgbs you don't have those so you just adjust your uh, choke separately are you talking about the h4s or are you take talking about hs i'm talking about the h4s and uh, i believe that when you adjust that l uh, piece on there they're supposed to uh, take the slack out on both yes. of them at the same time yes yes Yes, so that it, it, what you have to look at, you, you're underneath, you know, you're, you're right there, you're looking at the carburetor, and you're picking up the, the sheath on the, on the choke cable and pulling that out and pulling it very, very slowly. You pull it up, 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 and you watch, the, and then the jets begin to drop at the same time. You run out of slack at the same time on each carburetor, and, and to account for that, you've got as Fred said, that L-shaped piece and then, in there. Yeah. And I always put some, I, I I never let them go all the way down on an MGA because you got to pull it out of the choke, out of the dash about that far to get full movement. So, so you know, let them pick up, but let them pick up just a little bit. You get a lot of float in there, but they're always under tension. Yeah, they, they should be adjusted so that there's, not a whole lot of slack when you start pulling the cable it should start actually dropping those needle seats pretty quickly as soon as you start pulling that choke cable but it should return all the way so if your your jets come up can i make what, a what about the cam on there for the for they've got the uh, numbers one two and three i know it's for the different parts of the season you're supposed to change that but uh really what's a good in between uh number to number go two. on i always said huh? on two yeah. Good point. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I've, just, seen all, I've seen them on one all the time, but I always set them on two. It just, it, you know, when you start to pull the cable out of the dash, you want the first third of the cable to increase the RPM and the second That's two thirds of the movement to drop the jet. Because it is a control. You go back to a TC. It's really slick because they, they've got it, it. They've broken the choke into two into two parts. Yeah. Um, one is the choke itself, dropping the jet, and the other one's just increasing the idle. And it's really it's nice. Slow, I mean, slow running cable. <laughs> sometimes, um, even with my MGA, you know, sometimes it's just handy. You're in traffic, and all of a sudden the temperatures. I it just. All of a sudden, it wants to idle at 600. And I don't want it to idle at 600. I don't want it to stall. So you pull the choke out like one notch, and it just lifts the RPM. And that's you know, it's it's an it's an RPM control. So, can I throw a comment, um, John? Hey, Hi there, John. <laughs> uh, towards uh, John Turchak, uh, his some of his comments and questions. When the choke that those that that L-shaped um, piece that has the threads on it to adjust the front and rear carburetor on your choke. If those holes in that bra those brass shafts have started to oval out, it becomes very, very hard to get your front and rear carburetor to balance out correctly. Sometimes you have to either solder in a new piece to, to, to yeah. fix those holes or buy the, a new set of levers, but th that choke can be very sensitive to wear. Don't forget, those carburetors are 60 plus years old. Yes, that's <laughs> They wear out. The other thing um, on that L-shaped piece is there's two what's called a factory washers, They're like springy washers that go on either side of the um, um, square block that is that goes into the lower um, control arm of the, the choke so that the upper one goes into the upper arm the lower one goes into the lower arm and that's adjustable between the two but there's a, a springy washer called a factory washer that goes on either side of that block and then there's a nut on each side to uh, lock it in place and you don't want those to be squeezed all the way up you want a little bit of you know play in there but I yeah. That's a, the double, the double, it's not a double helix, but it's a, it's two swirls of, of a helical lock washer. Yeah. Yeah. Green steel. Yep. Can I throw a question, um, I guess, either, either at you, Fred or, or John. So I'm, I'm 
doing a little hobby business, re restoring carburetors in, in the Toronto area. And um, problem I've recently had is um, Viton tip uh, float needles um, sticking um, open. And really? I've had, I've, and I'm doing this for a, a shop and he's had two carburetors, one an HS6 and the other an H6. So two different carburetors. One was being done from a kit from Joe Curto, and one was a, a, an original Berlin kit, both with Viton needles and sticking open. And I get calls, these carburetors are leaking all over the place. Have you ever heard such a thing? New, brand new Viton needles? If, if, there, if, there's, no, if there's no good fuel filter, for, you know, feeding the carburetors, any piece of dirt will hold them open. A piece of you know a, a piece of just the tiniest piece of dirt will hold those things open. The Viton's nice because it's got some squish to it, a lot better than the steel ones. But um, take take a look at, at the bottom of the float bowl, see if you get any debris in there uh, when this happens, and see you know if if it's getting a lot of debris, then yeah, as John says, it could stick open. You know, I, I deliver these carburetors; they're they're immaculate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then I get a call. No, but I mean, af after they're installed, that's when you start getting the debris in them, not when you're rebuilding them. <laughs> the um, Nysinger Instruments so long ago um, was part of Nysinger Corporation, which which sold, you know, parts. There were a lot of individual uh, suppliers, Columbia Motor Corporation. There were a lot of J.C. Whitney, a lot of people selling the MG parts at the time, but Nysinger was one. And they had a rebuilding program for more than just instruments. You know, all kinds of stuff. And they finally gave up on SUs because they'd rebuild a set of SUs. They'd go out in the field and then somebody would say, hey, you know, these are POSs and, and uh, they, you know, they leak. And I, it, there's, it's, it, you know, the best you can do is use the, is use the high end, most expensive parts, which you are, if they're Berlin and Joe Curto, you know, that's it. And it, it's, it's got to be that there's a piece of crap coming through the fuel line. Unless... Unless I, I, for years, I never fitted a, I never fitted a, a fiber washer under the needle and seat. I just didn't, didn't have to. I got it really tight. And I had a guy call me up maybe three times in a row, and he said, I don't know what's going on. My, you know, my carbures are overflowing, and we went through and through and through. And he finally calls me up and he goes, he goes, you know, I finally put a washer underneath those needles and seats, and now the problem that I had is gone. So I started putting a washer underneath the needle and see, which doesn't come in the kit. If you get those things tight enough, they're not going to leak. That was my thought. But I started using washers underneath there. I mean, they're yeah. I mean, they're I'm, I'm using washers. When I, I examine the float lid, and if I see the float lid's been scored because it's been over tightened so many times, that's when I use a washer. When I see okay. it looks like it's had its day. Yeah, I, beyond that, beyond that, Alan, it's just your luck. Yeah, the, the Joe Curdo kits come with like a, a set of uh, probably four or six washers and you can stack them and, and do different heights. But part of that is for adjusting your float level uh, between the, the lever and the needle. Some of the later um, float bowls have a little tab uh, uh, and, the, and the float bowl, uh, the float lever has a little center tab so you can make it so it doesn't drop too far down and get stuck down. So you want to make sure that it's not dropping too far down because then it'll, it'll get stuck open. The, the HS used the washers for float height adjustment. Yeah. The earlier HS uh, do not put that washer in there. They want to be socked tight up against the zinc or... <laughs> Yeah, you, you could do it either way. I, I haven't noticed much difference, you know, but also setting your float level. Um, part of that is seeing where your fuel is in the um, jet when you're ready to, once you've filled up the float bowl, where's, can you see that float? Uh, can you see that fuel level in the bottom of your jet? So it's ready to be get picked up when that air starts going by. So that's a, uh, that's part of setting that float levels, making sure it's the same. There's a difference between the 1500 and the 1600 carbs. That level is different between the two because that's why they changed the 
the fitting on the bottom of the 1600 carb, instead of being just a banjo bolt, it's a, uh, a stud and a nut. And Say again? Height. The, the floor height changes? Yes. Between what? They're like five sixteenths and three eighths, or three eighths and seven sixteenths? It, it's not. I mean, the, the the float the float level is set the same, but the fuel level in the jet changes between. Interesting. All right. Okay. Not okay. That much. How, how do you like to judge the? I I like that one too. When you have the dash pot and piston off, and the uh, fuel pump has filled the float bowls. Yeah. What are you looking at in the jet well? Because you can really see it. And my 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 guesstimate is just give it a and if yeah. you see the fuel drop and then a little bit well over the edge of the jet, you're right where you want to be. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to you want to see it, you want to see the fuel level in the jet, and it should be about three sixteenths of an inch below the top. Between three sixteenths and maybe five sixteenths, I don't know. I I I, I can't hear you. Yeah, no, I think sixteenths is too deep. But if you can puff it in it, and the yeah. the recovery of the volume in the float bowl causes it to slightly well over the ed, end of the jet, yeah. then you know you're right there. You're ready for the vacuum. Something else that a lot of people don't think about is, uh, especially on the H. H series carburetors is um, that that breather tube that goes in the top of the float bowl has to be open. If if that gets clogged, you have no atmospheric pressure to relieve the pressure in the in the fuel bowl. So you have to have a, a air vent into the top of that bowl for it to work properly. I I had that so many years ago. We had a, our summer party. Guy drove up from Cleveland. Um, and he was traveling with a, a group, and one of them was an was an old, you know, British Leyland mechanic, Dave Mack. And he came up, and Dave says he, we they came in the shop on Sunday, so, um, and um, um, so we could get the car operational, so he, he could drive drive home. Uh, it wasn't Frank? It was um, I I'll think it was name in a minute. Anyway, um, Dave says I've checked the timing. I've checked up, checked up. He went through all the stuff that he's checked. And I listened to him. I said, "Okay, all right." So I took the took the nut off the top of the carburetor and pursed my lips around that banjo, and, <laughs> and I couldn't. It wasn't open. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. So we dragged it all the way out. I took the dirt or whatever was in the end of the tube out, and um, that that was the problem. It solved it out. And Dave was just incredulous. <laughs> he was, "How did you know to look at that?" I said, "Because, dude, you did everything else." You know, you told me, you told me everything else you did. You just didn't clear the, you didn't clear that. So, and we used to send those uh, carburetors when, when we did them, we, we put uh, copper tubing on the, on the um, banjos, new copper tubing. So it was all nice T-type stuff, you know, and, yeah. and um, copper tubing, you could actually bend with your thumb rather than the new stuff that, that breaks or kinks. And, um, and we'd wrap around a, a, a coffee can. And every now and then I'd go to a show and here's a set of carburetors that we'd done with this great big swirl of, of, uh, of, of copper tubing that hadn't been unfurled and run down. I mean, if, if you get a low point, any low point in that, in that line, all the way through to the 1980, any low point in that ventilation line, and you get and you get any kind of fluid in it at all, which would most likely yeah. be gasoline, it won't run well either. It won't run uh, won't run at all. So, yeah, yeah. yeah funny stuff. That's all There's I have. Any questions. other questions? I I have two questions. Go ahead. Um, break fast. I'm up in. Uh, uh, Leavenworth, Washington. Um, first question is the impact of the spring that goes in the air chamber. I'm, I'm trying to get around my head around whether increasing the spring rate causes a richer or a leaner mixture. Richer, richer, absolutely. Because it reduces the size of the venturi and inc therefore increases 
the amount of gasoline that's sucked out of there. It, it, it reduces, reduces the, the pressure there even more. Therefore, it, it, the, the air is going past the Venturi more quickly. Therefore, it's sucking out more fuel. Yeah, but uh, for me, the, the dichotomy is is that you, the needle's very deeper in the jet, right. so you have a smaller, uh, right. smaller it, annulus. Yep, yep, what? that's true. But but you asked, and that's the answer. The 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 oh. the, uh, the the smaller the venturi, the more gasoline gets sucked out. I, I've seen uh, okay. these. Uh, I've seen these springs all stretched way out, and I've seen them <laughs> cut know, off, and I, yeah, I've seen well, all kinds okay. of different things, but. You know, the, the ideal thing is use the correct springs. And that kind of leads me to my second question. And uh, I am looking at trying to put a set of issues on a, a Japanese engine that didn't have them to begin with. Do you guys have any good references for, for, for where to start on this thing as far as tuning it, getting the right uh, uh, a needle and, and uh, and and spring, Joe Curto, Joe Curto, call Joe. I mean, it's you've got a displacement and you've got an RPM range, so that's that's where he he and he'll he'll just shoot out some numbers to you, and you're going to have to experiment. Do you have a wide ba wide band uh, oxygen sensor available on the exhaust? I will. Yes. There, there, there. So you just start with something. You start with something. Okay. What's the displacement on that uh, Japanese engine? Two point two liter. Uh, uh, yeah. So it's uh, about one hundred and thirty four cubic inches or something like that. Yeah, yeah. What's my, my guess is that if if you if you look at the um, the recommendations for some of the British cars with dual carbs, um, you you probably want inch and three quarters for that size engine. Although inch and a half would work fine. Um, but uh, look look at needles for like a an Austin Healey three thousand, you know, or a, or a, a one hundred six. Those would be about the same displacement. I think that's about two point two liters. Actually, the, the uh, four was yeah. about two point two liters. The 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 Triumph, the TR fours, uh, I think came out to be two point two at some point. Yeah, it still maintained the SM needles. So I would you got a two carbs on it. You know, inch and three quarters on a 2.2 liter with the SM needles. I mean, it's the easiest place to start. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, you said SM Sierra uh, March. That's Sierra Mama. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's if, the, if, that's... if they're if they're inch and three quarter carburetors, yes. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're inch and three quarters. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Welcome. All right. Well, Fred said that that's about the. It was like it was like an hour ago that you know I didn't I and I apologize to everybody. I, I said we would uh, we're going to have Fred again. We're going to have Fred again. But the next time I am going to talk to him on the phone. So Fred, send me your phone number. You probably gave it to me before, but I apologize. On my and emails. Because Fred's got a really interesting. Um, presentation that he spent years coming up with because every SU carburetor has a code number on it. You've never seen it. We have seen it, but because it doesn't make any sense, you've ignored it. Yeah. And, and he's looked at enough of these for enough years so he can tell you what your code number is. Show, show us one of those code numbers, Fred. Uh, well, this one's probably kind of hard to see. They're all hard to see. Uh, this on uh, an H4 uh, at the at the intake manifold flange on the upper side. I don't know if you can. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Pull pull it a little farther away from the from the. Uh... Uh, can't. Yeah, there's. Uh, yeah, we can barely see something staffed in there. Yeah, there's there a, it is. Yeah. There it is. Do you see that? A Q? E Q. Okay. You know, so this is a date stamp. It's usually a, a letter and a number. And that, I can tell you 
typically uh, when that carburetor was manufactured and whether it matches your car, you're a manufacturer or not within a, a few months anyway. So very cool. So what I'd like to do now, I want to thank Fred very, very much for coming on. And I apologize to Fred and everybody for not getting in touch with Fred. Like I said, I was going to. And and um, um, anyway, I will for the next time. And we'll talk about the, these again. But I want to break into um, our chat section, um, which is, which is um, I, I'm just going to have to go really, really quickly here. We got 158 people on. I think I saw 177 on once before. So, so uh, anyway, so Steve Olson says, I made my reservations for Calgary. Looking forward to a long, he didn't say long, hot, sweaty trip. So Steve, I'll see you up there. And uh, Henry Lefevre says, great, see you then. Alan Vinegar, I've been having issues with my new Viton needles. We talked to Alan about that. Um, John Main, hello, everybody. I've got a 1980 LE. Um, I, well, good, but we haven't got a question here yet um, from John Main. Um, run better with SUs. Um, Peter, just a second here. We're going to get Peter uh, Koreski. We got a 77B with uh, overdrive. The speedometer is flickering. I replaced the cable with a new one, making sure it has smooth, no kink route to the speedo. I made sure the cable was well greased uh, with lithium grease up to four inches of the speedo. I'm still getting a flicker when coming up to speed. Once I get up to speed, um, uh, it seems to stay steady with just a tad of flicker. Could it be the speedo itself? It could be, but it's a 77B. More likely, the rear nut on the gearbox is loose. Tighten up the rear nut on the gearbox. Now, that's easy to say. The problem's holding the flange while you tighten the nut. If you've got an impact gun, no problem. You put that, I think it's one in five sixteenths. It's a huge nut. It was an inch and an eighth. I don't remember. Put a gun on there, bam, 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 and, and tighten it up. There, those speedo-driven gear used to be keyed. They dropped the key, probably cost-cutting measure, at some point prior to 77. So if that rear nut comes loose, which it does, um, then then the, the, the driving gear will freewheel. So are, are you still on, Peter? Yeah, Fred? yeah. Uh, you're saying that I need to tighten to tighten the nut on the uh, on the uh, rear flange of the gearbox. Take take the drive shaft off and get up in there with an impact gun. If you don't have an impact gun, you got to hold the gearbox from turning. Go, well, I'll just put it in gear. <laughs> no way, no way. Whatever wrench you put on there will turn the engine. So if you have to, what I've got is a long bar. I drill two holes in it, put two 516s long bolts, put a nut on each one of them. So you got two 516 studs, stick it out, put it in the flange, measure the flange first. Can't tell you right now off the top of my head what the center to center is, but it's a rectangle. It isn't a square, it, it, it's a rectangle. And, um, and, and then hold that rear flange from turning. Put a socket on it, crank it down. That is probably the problem. Okay. Probably. Do you have your old Speedo cable? Uh, no, I probably threw it away. Oh, now you know you violated the first rule of MG ownership, and that is never throw any used part away. So with your old Speedo cable, you could cut it off, put it in your drill, put the drill on, on reverse, put it on the Speedo, watch it, and, and you'd see that the Speedo is holding steady. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it does flicker. Um, you can also do that from underneath with a drill and then have somebody go up top and, and watch it. Or better, have them go, because you know what you're looking for, have them down underneath in a normal household Makita drill on high speed will give you 30 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour. You know, it, it's, um, um, it, it isn't, you're not going to be able to watch it at 60. Um, but it's it's enough you, you usually to tell if that if that's flickering. So it came off my transmission with no problem. I mean, it, I just unscrewed it and just came off right on out with no problem that way. And of course, I 
had to put it in the uh, speedometer, uh, that thing comes out really easy on the dash. So I made sure that I had a good, good path, no kinks or anything like that. So it's just I really need to tighten the nut on the transmission itself. Okay, I'll I'll go ahead and because it's, it's right there at the crossbar, and that thing was a bear to get out. So okay, yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, oh, good luck. Where 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 do you live? Virginia. Yeah, front row, Virginia. Okay, were, were you at the Hunt Country Classic a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago? No, I wasn't at that class because that class was a, a late class, but I was uh, at that uh, the uh, Classic there, uh, at the Hunt Country Classic with you. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, hey, thanks a lot. Wayne Peterson, this is about my speedometer. Hey, go figure, you know, things come in pairs. Originally, it was stuck. When I unstuck it, it just uh, recorded distance and no speed. Well, there are two there are two units in the speedo head. One's the odometer, one's the speedometer. They're they're quite distinct. I had the speedo repaired and then found it would record distance and speed for only about ten minutes. I checked the cable, tightened the nut at the back of the transmission, and the problem persisted. I finally removed the pinion gear, gear from the transmission and found I could turn the nylon gear on the shaft. Oh my gosh. I removed the gear, put a drop of glue on it and uh, let it sit for a few days. Now the Speedo works great, smooth operation. So are you still on Wayne Peterson? I'm here. So I'm you're here. telling me that the, that the, that the, that the plastic was slipping on the on the on the on the steel inside of the gear. That's right. It was slipping there, and I think it started slipping when the speedometer froze up. Uh, well, okay. All right. Makes sense. Okay. All right. That's the first time I've ever heard of that. Ever. 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 So to um, my former guy here, Peter Kresky. So what did you, you had to take the gearbox out, or did you do that all in place? In place. I did so you place. took the speedo drive out of the gearbox. That's right. You went up there with a tiny little drill, about four inches long, drilled a hole in the. No, 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 no. no. There's two little screws that take the, the fitting off the side of the transmission. Right. And I pull it out, and the and the nylon gear comes with it. Oh, oh, oh! This is the driven gear. Yes. The driven gear. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then I took that apart. With the glue in the in the hole in the side of the nylon thing and okay. the thing back together again. Okay. And the glue is good for metal or plastic and it works great. Hey, okay, okay. I've never heard of this first time we, we've heard about. I just got I got an, another double one today. Uh, a guy a guy took his his uh, Stromberg carburetor apart, went to went to to take the um, float off the little bracket that holds a pin on which the float moves up and down and the bracket broke off the inside of the carburetor. Second time that I've, I've heard of it. So there's all these all these new things that continue to happen. Um, so yeah, and he fixed, I suggested he fixed his with um, um, some, some uh, drilling and some screws, which wouldn't of course work with yours. But anyway, thank you very, very much. Thanks very much. I will add that to my list of possible repairs. Great. Thanks. Wayne, where, where are you from? San Luis Obispo, California. Oh, all right. Okay. Jason Lenz country. But the, he's, he sold out to Moss. His he sold out, yes. Jags. The business, the uh, repair shop is still here. Okay. Just, just oh. across, I can see the repair shop from my house almost. Oh, my gosh. There's a guy from Grand Rapids, uh, Cliff Bridge, that moved there. I don't know, 19, give me a date, 1978, 1982, Clifford. Yep, went out to work for Jason. So, yeah, long time ago. All right, thanks very much, Wayne, B very much. That's, that's a nice repair. Mike Baldwin. Um, okay, well, hey, all right, here, here we go. He's sitting in with a dram or two of, of Pusser's British Naval Rum. All right, enjoy my 66 tinsel. Christmas tree with a color wheel. Got it from my parents. Remember it well. Um, Mike, are you still on? 
Yeah, yes, sir, John. I'm, I'm uh, Jim, uh, John here. I just got it rather looking at my mug tonight. I got the the Christmas tree in uh, my avatar, so it's been spinning its heart out here all night. Hey, very nice. Where, where are you from? Uh, Black Mountain, North Carolina, near Asheville. Okay. All right. Tom Boscarino's country down there. Yeah. Yep. 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 Met your uh, nephew at Lookout Brewing a few years ago and sent you a picture. Okay. Yep. Great. Thanks for being on. You're welcome. Okay, I, I, I got to keep moving here because it's 8.54. Normally we end at 9 and I bet I got a lot of questions here on chat. Okay. From David's iPad. It's an unusual last name. Oh, Mr. iPad. After 110,000 miles on my, in 1980 MGB, it's time to replace the clutch. Couple of questions. What cl clutch components should be replaced? All three, the, the pressure plate, the disc, and the throwout bearing, and the front seal on the gearbox, and the rear seal on the engine, and um, the uh, release bearing fork, bolt, and bushing. So there's a bunch of stuff on, on there. Oh, the engine's out of the car. What components should be replaced? The side cover gaskets, absolutely, on the, on the uh, underneath the manifolding. The rear one's okay. That doesn't leak anyway. But the front one, oh, my gosh. And right now, here I hear tell. Uh, the last time I bought one, the front gaskets don't fit. So I had to make my own. I went to Napa and bought some, some sheet cork and cut a cut a gasket out of, uh, so that it would fit the front tappet inspection cover and used uh, the, either the right stuff, I think that's probably what I used, Permatex, the right stuff. What a stupid name. Why, why not for Permatex 989 or something? Anyway, use that, gobbed it on both sides of the gasket and changed the front seal. Of course, that means you got to take the front cover off. That means you're going to look at the at the chain, and you're going to look at the tensioner. The tensioner's toast, right? After 110,000 miles, tensioner's toast. And you go, why should I put a new tensioner on an old chain? You go, I might as well change. I might as well change the chain and the tensioner. But don't look any further. Don't go. Don't go any further because, as my late wife Caroline said, once you open them up, they develop an appetite. Um, Let's see, currently the engine um, runs good, not much oil consumption, uh, some piston slap at idle and low compression on the number two cylinder. Now the number two cylinder is probably, a, a, probably an exhaust valve, that would be common. Number two and num number three exhaust valves go first. Um, piston slap, uh, now, now the thumb's off, the head's off, the pistons are out, new rings are in. Oh, my gosh. You know, and uh, I just heard from Glenn Lenhard, my buddy in, in St. Petersburg, Florida, just the other day. He said, we used to get an engine rebuilt in two or three weeks. Now it's taken the better part of a year because the machine shops are all closing up and getting the machine shop to bore your engine correctly and to do it and to actually put it in line and get the thing back. He said it's starting to push a year. So maybe if it's just a little bit of piston slap, slap you can go with that. You can also put new rings in it. Um, are you still on? Yeah, um, it's Dave, Dave Balsilli uh, in Oh, Omaha. yeah. Thanks for your contributions. Thanks. So anyway, it's like, you know, you know, the engine's out. This is the time to do it. Of course, this is the time to do it. But oh, my gosh, you know. Where, yeah, where where are you from? Uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Okay, all right. Well, if you've got a machine shop that can get your car, your engine in and out, and just do the machine work, you know, and that is put in cam bearings and bore it, uh, and turn the crank, um, and do a valve job on it, and get that all done within a month or two. It is still winter. And it's, what did I, somebody just told me it's negative four in Tulsa last week or something. Um, um, so you got, you got some time, but you know, that, that means you got to assemble the engine yourself. And in, even though you may not be, I don't know, I don't know your mechanical ability, but um, if you send me an email, I'll send you my, my list of how to rebuild an engine and it's step-by-step step and it's, it's uh 
it, it's pretty clear on what to do, but of course you still gotta be a mechanic to interpret all the instructions, somewhat of a mechanic, allow 18 thousandths gap on the, on the piston rings, then you get a whole new engine out, out of the deal, or you can just put it back in. It worked before, it'll work now, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I, I like just, that option you know, because hey, there's no way I'm going to tackle this. There's no way that's going to happen. You can yourself pull the sump off, change the rod bearings, change three of the main bearings, and the oil pump. It's really easy. Really okay. easy. Call me. I'll talk to you more about it. Um, and that you can extend the life of the engine because... Uh, if you get if you start to get crummy oil pressure and you start to get a rod knock, it's just you're forced at that point to do this stuff. Piston slap can get worse and worse and worse until it finally gets so bad that that you know that you go, oh my god, I can't stand it anymore. But it, it, the engine doesn't fail as a result. The engine will fail from bad rod bearings. I mean, what's your oil pressure running down the road? It, it's good. It's, it's seventy psi. That's great. But still, at 110,000, it's, it's excellent. Still, change the rod bearings, change the center three mains, change the oil pump. It's easy to do, really easy to do. Okay. So. Um, one other question I have uh, with regard when we're storing our cars in the wintertime, uh, is it a good technique to keep everything hooked up with the battery and just put a trickle charger on it? Or do most guys just disconnect the batteries and and just leave everything dead? Over you the don't. You don't want the battery to discharge. Okay, for two reasons. One is if it goes all the way dead and freezes, it blows up. And the other one is that it's just the battery battery life is is longer if you keep it charged. So whether you take it out of the car, or leave it in the car, put a trickle chart, not a trickle, a battery tender on it. Right. Um, um, but if you've got the engine out, you can make a case that, you know, since you've got those wires dangling out in front, that <laughs> I'm probably going to disconnect the battery, you know? Right. Sorry. Okay, thank okay. you. Hey, you're very, very welcome. Good luck. I get it. I just got to cruise on this because because um, uh, Fred and I took up a whole lot of time talking about issues, and we still didn't talk about them enough, you know? Doug McLaren. I'm getting my 79B on the road. It's been stored for 15 years. The paint is badly oxidized. Any recommendations as how to recover the finish? The paint is original. Doug, are you still on? I got an I'm here, yeah. Okay. Yeah, fine. All right. Okay, so where, where are you from? I'm, I'd say uh, west of Canada Falls, Ontario, Canada. Okay, so someplace around your town or a town close to you are is a used car prep shop, right? They okay. take the cars in, they make them look brand new. I like that. A couple of hundred bucks. They'll buff it all out. They'll find all the nicks on it. They'll find some green paint. They got a thousand different uh, different shades of green paint. They'll find some green paints close enough to yours and roll it in with a with a toothpick. Wait for it to dry, buff it out again. You'll know where, where it is, of course, but um, it'll look good to everybody else. That's that's the easiest, cheapest way out. Okay. Or you can buy yourself a buffer and learn how to buff a car with your own car and your own buffing wheel, which means you're going to burn the paint, you know, at some point. I have a buffer. And I've, I, it's not the green car. It's a, it's a pageant blue 79. That's the, the green one is the reason I never got at the pageant blue 79, but okay. anyway, um, it, so, so now I'm getting it out, but I, I just, I little, get a little worried with a buffer. I have a, a fairly gentle buffer, but I'm always afraid that I'll go right through the paint and, and, and start looking at metal. I, I really want to save the paint. So if you want to get really excited, then you take, I wouldn't take the windscreen off because it's such a bitch, but take take all the lamps off, take the, take the chrome strips off if, if you dare, um, and which means you gotta gut the doors or else leave the chrome strip on the door, but get, get off the front and rear. Um, take the lamps off, take the, maybe take the bumpers off, the license plate, stuff the luggage rack if you've got one on that badge and blue one too. And, uh -huh. uh, and then then those guys can, you, they don't have to worry about coming up close to the lamps and everything. 
or not, <laughs> or not, you know, and, yeah. and really in the buff it out, make it look as beautiful as you can, polish it, wax it, and then go ahead and put all those lamp assemblies back, back on. So it what was. Do you what do you use? I I tried that turtle wax cream to and and rub you gotta, that. You got to get you got to you got to buff it. You got to use you got to use a um, grit. I mean, it okay. isn't very gritty. It isn't very gritty, but you got to use grit to, to clean up the paint. And those used car guys are just are. I mean, that's what they do all day. They take cars that someone's committed suicide inside the car, you know, and they and they and they freshen it all up and make it look like a brand new car again, you know, spray the new, new car stuff inside. And you'd never know, you know, so. Okay, I'll give it a shot, thank you. Okay, good luck. Rodolfo, hey, um, okay, are you still on, Rodolfo? Yes, sir. Hey, hey. Hola. Hola. Sometimes after going uphill, after pushing for a minute or more, I get a five second loss of power, then a backfire, and it goes back to pushing again. Is it too rich or bad floats? Oh my God. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 can, I just can feel this. I can feel this happen. It's not because it's too lean. A five second loss of power and then a big a bam and then and then it's going again. Fred, yeah. what what do you say? You're you're an SU guy. Fred, you're so I, I know Fred's still on. Right here, my my yes use. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not. I'm not thinking of. Well, it could be carburetor. In that, um, if you're running out of fuel, um, it'll 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 backfire because it's running too lean. Bingo! You're right. Yes, thank you. But but, but that's then, not a backfire. That's that's spinning through the carburetor. Yeah. So I mean, you could um, try pulling the choke out a little bit while you're going up this hill and see if that fixes the problem. That'll okay. tell you if you're running too lean. You're you're oh. in a very high altitude, right? Uh, well, not not so much. Uh, Monterrey, it's uh, I don't you're know down by the coast. Yeah, I, it's near uh, the border. It's almost like Texas, you know. It's uh, at the same level. Okay, okay but, but low, Fred, low line, Fred's yeah. right here. Absolutely, Fred's right. Pull next next time you're going up a hill, pull the choke out. It's either going to make it better or worse. Okay, yeah, okay. I'll do that. Those do the cheapest, easiest, simplest stuff first. Pull the choke out, it's going to make it better or worse. If it makes it worse, then it's already too rich. If if it if it solves it, it's too lean. So crank the crank the uh, the uh, adjusters down just a little bit. So Okay, I'll do that. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. I got I just kind of keep cruising here. I usually you know talk uh, Mark B, thinking of adding ported vacuum uh, takeoff to an HIF carburetor for Eurospec distributor. Any suggestions? Yes, Mark B, are you still on? I am. Okay, send your carburetor body, your rear carburetor body, to Rob Medinsky, a British vacuum unit in New Hampshire. He's got a jig. He, he'll bolt it up. He, he drills it just in the right spot, puts a tit on it. Bingo, it's done. But you got to, you know, you get take the carburetor all, all apart so you don't have to screw around with it. And uh, of course, there's some, you know, some swarf and stuff from from the drilling. But that's it. Uh, doing it by hand, who knows where you're going to yeah. end up? And you want to be right, real oh, close. That's to it. it. I have it apart now. That I'm rebuilding, so okay. I'll email you, and maybe you could send me his address, sir. At um, Robinsky British Vacuum Unit. And you, you, he's on the web, but yes, I, if you, if you can't, yep, he's in New Hampshire. So, yep, absolutely. And the Eurospec distributor you got is a 41,427, an original one? Uh, I believe it is, It's uh, but I put electronics in it, so. Okay, well, just as long as, it, yeah, okay. Um, the the um, the Eurospec distributor they used all the way up through the end was a 41427, which is the same as the 408975D, but it's it's in a 45D body. So anyway, that's that's the that's the solution to your problem. So thanks. Where where are you, Mark? I'm in San Jose, California. Oh my! I wish there was somebody closer. But on the other hand, once you put it in the box and go to the post office, who cares? You know who cares if it goes to 
to Reseda or, or, um, or, you know, to New Hampshire. So, okay. Uh, uh, what was his name again? So I'll write it down it and is, search um, him out here. This British vacuum unit. It's an odd name, but he started off making a vacuum advance units for okay. for distributors. And now he does a full service. Uh, Jeff Schlemmer is another guy that does distributor service, an advanced distributor. But Rob's got the jig for putting that port on an HIF carburetor. All right. Well, great. I'll look him up there. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Next one up here is Susan and Stewart's iPad. Another another iPad. You maybe you guys are, are related, huh? Uh, Susan and Stewart, you guys still on? Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks for hanging on. Uh, hi, John. I'm just finishing up the XBAG on my 53 TD, and I'm not getting oil pressure. Okay, should I smear a ton of grease or assembly lube or Vaseline in the oil pump um, to create the vacuum? Yeah, that's one way to do it. So um, the problem is you've, you've got your engine in the car, you can't get oil pressure. So the, you always do the cheapest, easiest, simplest stuff first. You got a horizontal filter or vertical filter? Horizontal. horizontal. Okay, horizontal. so you got, a, you, got a, you got a brass plug on the top of the oil filter housing. Yes. And you got a brass plug on the engine. So yep. you you take your oil can and glug, 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 glug. You fill those things up. Cheap trick now is put it in fourth gear and push it backwards. Okay, that'll take the oil and screw it backwards through the oil, uh, through the through the oil pump and down into the sump, right? Once you do that, you've got enough oil on the oil pump to create that vacuum. Take the spark plugs out, pull the starter motor, you know, 20 seconds, try it for 20 seconds, give the starter motor a break, try it again. Duty cycle on a, on a starter motor is not, a, not 100%, you know? Um, and um, if you can't get oil pressure after a couple of minutes of, of trying 20 second bursts, something's gotta come off. It's real common to have a, a, a leak between that flange on the inside of the sump where you got the two bolts to go through or between the, between the, uh, the sump and the block. This is why when you put the sump on, you put the sump gasket onto the block with the right stuff or some kind of get some kind of gasket goo, and between the between the um, between the sump and the gasket, you only use grease. So when you have to take the sump off again, it just comes off. Oh. So, Great idea. Okay. So, but that that's you always do the cheapest, easiest, simplest stuff first. So, so try to get the oil screwed back down through. But packing it with grease isn't going to help. Engine's back in the car now, right? Well, yeah, it's it's a it's a new rebuild. It's a full restoration. So, okay, yeah. Well, well, some people, John, some people have had success pressurizing. Just uh, squirt some yeah. air pressure into the uh, uh, dipstick tube, and that'll push the oil up until it gets started. Yep, that that can do it too. That can do it too. I failed to, to mention that. Um, do you have you, you got a, a real rear seal on that, or do you have the new Moss lip seal on the uh, on the back? I believe it's the new Moss lip, lip seal. Okay, so you got to be a little careful with pressure. So if you get a new Moss lip seal there, you got the one four double oh five uh, Chicago rawhide seal in the front too, probably. Um, and if you get too much pressure inside the engine, which is all but impossible to do, uh, I mean, you can disturb those seals. So you got this big oil pressure, um, the, the, the draft tube, right? I mean, it's big around as your thumb. So you have to block that off and then pressurize the, pressurize the engine somehow. What we always did was wrap a rag around a blowgun and just stick, stick it in the valve cover. And the idea was to put pressure on the oil to force the oil, you know, force the oil down and up, up through, um, and that that could work, but almost always, like ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, as long as you've got the 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 oil or the the gears um, oiled up, it'll it'll draw it up in there. But again, you do the 
you do anything before you take the sump off because it's easier, right? So, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, you, you're very welcome. And John, thanks for weighing, uh, weighing in with that. Greg Fast, Chamber Springs, how does the spring rate affect mixture? So we, we, we talked about that all, all, already. Um, I think, matter, matter of fact, you were on and, and asked about that. Stronger the spring, greater the mixture. Um, Naomi's iPhone. Here we got three people from the same family, the iPhone family. John, uh, great to see you last night out at the Christmas party. Oh, uh, how much oil do you add? So Naomi's iPad, are you still on here? Na Naomi's iPhone? You're yes, John. IPhone. Yes, oh, I was going to say your iPhone battery is probably dead by now. Um, uh, yes, that the party is a lot of fun. Fill up the I I fill up the dash pots all the way. It doesn't make any difference because they will seek their own level. They as soon as they start to run, I assume you're talking about oil in the dash pots, right? Yeah, I, you know I've got that new TD to me, and uh, so I'm working my way around the carburetors. I'm, I'm probably going to have to rebuild them. We talked about that the other night, but it occurred to me that maybe I I should check the dash pot oil and also check the uh, check the lines and make sure I don't have anything bur burrowed into my uh, into my vent lines too. So, but I was just curious about the, I guess I have the H2s. I have the uh, the TD2 engine because that was replaced by the previous owner in 1956 or seven. Okay. Uh, but uh, I was just curious about the dash pots on that, on that carburetor. So just fill them right up. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, if, if it's, if you've never had them off, take them off and clean them. Use, I will. Carburetor, use carburetor cleaner. That's what I use. Fred suggested soap and water. That that that's good too. You know, just be careful because you don't want to bend the needles. The needles are, are you know, um, and um, and you drain the oil and put some ninety weight in there. And then if if you take those uh, banjo, those won't be clogged up. That's such a bizarre problem. Um, <laughs> but but. If you, take, if, if you take you know take that brass uh, brass bolt off the top of the of the of the um, suction chamber, purse your lips around that banjo and blow. Um, you can tell immediately if it's open or not. So, but as long as you're that far, then of course Chris can take the float bowl lids off and look down in there and see how much silt is in there. Then there's a bunch of crap in there. Just take some paper towel, and wipe it all out. So we'll do. Okay, okay, good. Hey, that, that, that was that was that was a lot of fun um, at the at the uh, Rochester. I, I didn't say enough about the Rochester Christmas party. I got into my rant about the or not rant, but the discussion about the, the all the various clubs and so forth. But I didn't say that the Rochester, the Western New York MG Car Club Center located in Rochester, New York, invited me to be the the featured speaker at their Christmas party this year. It was the biggest Christmas party they'd had in a long time. It's some 88, and that sounds like a good number, 88 people there. I'd say that that was because I was there and I was the attraction, but on the other hand, COVID is over. So I, every, everybody came out except for, um, I saw George Haynes, but I didn't see, um, come on. Um, sure. Help me out. Landswagger. Yeah, Gil. Gil. I didn't. I, I didn't see. I was looking forward to seeing Gil. He couldn't make it, um, but we had a wonderful time. It was a wonderful dinner. It was. It was. Uh, it was just great. Altogether great. And I gave a nice presentation showing the optional use, the optional use for the H four SU carburetor. So yeah, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll do that next time. Next time I, I've got Fred on. If I if I call him on the phone and get it set up like I'm supposed to. So anyway, thank you very, very much. Chuck Lenick. Okay, Chuck, are you still on? I, I haven't answered your question about the gearbox yet on email. I apologize. Chuck, are you still on? Yes, sir. I'm here. Okay. All right. Okay. I need to buy a new clutch and pressure plate. And are, are there any brands that are better? Well, the, the Borg and Beck brand isn't, you know, I mean, it's, uh, God knows they're all made in China and, and they bought the rights to use the name Borg and Beck, but um, uh, use the best stuff you can possibly find. Apparently the new throw up bearings are okay now for a while. They were, they, there was a problem with some of them, but the last time I talked to my main man at Moss Motors, 
those, those are okay. Um, so, uh, you know, just uh, you can buy the eight inch disc if you want to get a little excited. You can buy the competition pressure plate, which, which uh, takes more uh, uh, force from your foot to throw it out. Um, and that I've used that on my MGA for, I don't know, 40 years. And I, I love it. It's nice. Um, and I got an MGB clutch on my MGA. And it, it's just a stiff clutch, which means you can, you know, when you slip your foot off the clutch pedal, dump the clutch, pop the clutch, you know, you can make it bite in second gear. You can get a squeak out of second gear. It, it, it's so powerful. So on an eight inch disc, which is also the same disc for a TR6. Um, that, that's, that's a little bit better. You get a little more contact area. So, um, but the throw up bearing, I'd use a carbon one now, like the, like the original ones were. And as long as you've got the engine and gearbox apart, out, on a 66B, I'd change the rear seal on the engine. I'd change the front seal on the gearbox, change the, um, um, Throwout bearing bolt and bushing. So. Okay. Thank you. Your dog hasn't moved since since you came on. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well trained dog. Um, I I got I got a background that that um I've been using and it's I I just wanted to use it tonight and it's gone. I I got to find it again. So anyway, hey, I'll, I'll I'll talk to you soon. It's a pleasure. Chuck's part of the Emerald Necklace. I you know I sit tight and sit and talk with everybody for a while, but but I still have some more messages here. Um, let's see who's on next. Gary Gersh, Carrie, Carrie Gersh, are you still on, Carrie? We're down to 113 people. Not everybody can wait this long. My TD runs pretty well, but it slows down a lot when I'm driving uphill. I also find a lot of carbon in my plugs. Have trouble keeping the car um, from running too rich. Is there any other conclusion to draw other than the car needs a carburetor rebuild? Most carburetor problems are distributor problems. So you got to make sure the distributor is good. It's timed correctly, static, zero static, or 32 or if, at uh, full mechanical advance. And um, after that, then yes, the carburetors, but you can set the float height. It's probably okay with the float height. And as long as you're using, oh, TD Mark II is supposed to use, oh, not ES needles. Those are standard TD needles. Mark II uses the, not GJ, which are TF1500 LS1, right? Fred, that's right, isn't it? LS ones for TD Mark Mark yeah, I mean, I'd, have to, I'd have to look it up. I don't know. I <laughs> just just bugged you. Um, so anyway, but Kerry is not anyway. Unless he's just listening. So um, distributor first, carburetor second. Well, engine first, distributor second, uh, carburetors third, and then um, you can usually repair everything in situ. Um, you don't have to have a complete $500 rebuild on the carburetors, but you can change the jets and needles in, in place. Uh, matter of fact, it's easier to change them in place than taking them off the car and do, doing it. So anyway, okay, let's see. Tom C to everybody. Tom C, are you still on? Tom C, uh, the compliment here to Fred Horner. Yes, Fred, I am. Yeah, okay. Okay, Fred, take that one home. Fred, help me identify my SU carburetors. Okay, yeah, because that, I mean, hey, for identity politics, not identity politics, I, I, for identity, Fred's the man on SUs, absolutely. So, okay. So where, where are you from, Tom? Uh, Dallas, Texas. All right, okay. What's the temperature there today? Uh, it's, not that, it's not that warm here. It's about 45 degrees, and it's going to drop down in the next couple of days down to 17. Which oh is my gosh. Pretty cool. Oh my gosh. Here it comes. Yeah. Ah, but four months from now, you know, the, the leaves will be starting to green up again. And well, maybe three days from now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Next one up is Ron from Australia. Ron, are you, st you still on? It's only noon where you are. We're all getting ready to go to bed. 
Ron, Ron from Australia. I don't think he's on anymore. Can you speak about air filters? And if you increase airflow, should you update your needles? Oh boy, that's the thing. You know, those, those uh, K&N filters, they said, oh my gosh, you know, you get a K&N filters. There's, there's not, uh, it doesn't uh, restrict the airflow as much and you should use AAA needles. But my experience has always been the AAA needles are too lean. So what's the difference between standard and FX needles? Well, um, FX needles are standard for a 68. Help me out. Fred, I go back to you. I think FX needles are, are, are standard for 68s. And on 69, they change because they, they go to spring loaded. Um, but sometimes you got to fiddle around a little bit and find the, find the right needles for your car. Uh, but you don't want to vary off too much. And without a wide band oxygen sensor, you're shooting in the dark. But a pair of needles is, um, I don't know, what's a pair of needles now cost? 40 bucks? So you can buy a couple sets of needles and experiment, whereas in a wideband oxygen sensor, you gotta, first of all, you gotta get, get a bung welded into your exhaust, and then you gotta get the wideband oxygen sensor. So I, that's probably more expensive. So let's see, Mike Baldwin, can Jim Simino turn down his mic level? We are about two hours late for that, so. Um, Denny, Denny, are you still on about the color tune? Are you still around? We're down to 101 people, but we're at 925. And we're going to run this to about 930. So Denny, are you still on? Opinions on color tune. Color tune is like a window on your oven. You know, you can watch everything happen, but if you follow the right recipe, you're home free to start with. So uh, it isn't necessary to to, uh, to have a, a color tune. As a matter of fact, the instructions in the color tune ask you to get a blue flame. If you get a blue flame, your car will never run right. It's gotta be an orangey red flame to be correct. And they're kind of gimmicky. Um, they'll, they'll, for some people, sometimes they, they can, all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, you know, my, 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 my first, my one and two carbs or carb, running the one and two cylinders or are it's like blue and I can't make it red. Now then then that tube that tube is is plugged up that that banjo overflow tube or something so it's something wrong with the PCV system. It can tell you something sometimes but it's kind of kind of I I I've used to be fair. I've used one one time one time to say that I had and that was I don't know, probably 30 years ago. So Anyway, David's iPad. Oh, wait, didn't we already answer David's iPad? Um, in the, in the, uh, yes. yes, you did. Yeah, we yeah, did. You did. Okay. Um, <laughs> from David. Is that still David? Boy, am I glad I got a Weber on my car. Is that David? Yeah, that's all right. That's okay. right. After, after all of this tonight, yeah, <laughs> I'm glad it's a Weber. Well, and that's the advantage of the Weber. It's so simple. It's so simple, and so many cars use the Weber. And you can buy parts everywhere, and lots of lots more people know how to work on a Weber than they do on an SU. But I mean, come on. <laughs> I've turned I've turned that mixture screw maybe three or four times in twenty years. Yep. And, but you do you have a stall right if you do a full throttle acceleration? I mean, nope. hammer it is a stop sign. Does it stumble for a second? Nope, it takes off. Okay, all right. Do you have a do you have a, a, a manifold that's got a, a hot water um, a, um, heater on the bottom of it? Nope, I've got okay. a header on it. You know, it has okay. a header. Well, bully for you. Hey, okay, all right. Hey, you know, great, great. Um, Blair, Blair uh, Weiss has said, don't forget, Fred will be presenting at Kimberfest. I haven't mentioned, mentioned any of the upcoming events. Kimberfest is later in April this year. Um, it's, it's always around the time of Cecil Kimber's birthday. Cecil Kimber is the man who, who created, discovered, not, not discovered, he created MGs. 
out of Morris's. He was the salesman and then the general manager at Morris Garages. And uh, and out of out of his out of his fantasy came MG. So um, anyway, we celebrate his birthday. He was born in 1888. Maybe that's his fascination with octagons. And Blair, are you still on? No, nope, Blair's gone. Uh, but anyway, Kimberfest is going to be at the Simeon Museum in Philadelphia towards the end of April. I'll have some stuff up on my website. There's other stuff up. It's a really great place to go and get a whole different view of MG stuff. It's a, it's a, um, 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 their presentations will be six, probably not eight, probably six presentations. I just spent uh, a night with Gord Watley who runs the Kimberfest uh, last week in Acton, Ontario. And, and, um, He's uh, He's got books. He's got lots and lots of MG books. I bought way too many more MG books from him when I was up there. And um, anyway, he's the he's the leader of Kimberfest. And and Tom Lang Langa um, presents at at Kimberfest. I do. Blair Weiss did last year. Did a nice one on on uh, um, LED lights. Um, <clears throat> Fred did one on SUs. He's going to do one on originality and uh, code numbers and so forth on, on different different things like starter motors and, and, the, and uh, control boxes. Anyway, I'm off, I'm, I'm talking again. Jeffrey, to everybody, unrelated, any suggestions on undercoating? I have completed a body off restoration and really like the look of a perfect clean undercarriage and body panels, et cetera. Yeah, leave it like that, okay? Are, are you still on by any chance? This is I'm here. Good. Okay. All right. Where, where are you from? Nashville, Middle Tennessee. Okay. All right. You know, if it's all clean and all beautiful, just paint it. It's so great. If, on the other hand, you're, you know, it's like, nah, you know, because the, the underside gets, gets, gets all the road dirt, you know, and, and animals and everything else. I mean, it does get beat up really quickly in yes, market yes. contrast to the rest of the car if you've got to undercoat it get get the uh, get the undercoated undercoating um um infused dyed um the run um, um, color coded color colored colored the same as the rest of your car yeah, yeah. yeah. and and put it on lightly you can get rubberized undercoating uh, it doesn't have to be dripping, you know, but rubberized on undercoating so that when the rock comes up, it sort of bounces off it and doesn't do as much damage as it would when it was just raw. But it's so beautiful when it's raw, you know, I, I mean, when it's just painted and there's no undercoating. So yeah, we, yes. we did an MGB with the Rhino liner with the color in it, and that worked really well. Okay, thank you. So I usually ask for other people to weigh in here too, but oh my gosh. All right, Robert Moran, my TD choke cable pulls very difficultly. Any reasons why? Yes, Robert, are you still on? Yes, I am. Okay, how, how new is that choke cable? Brand new. It's too long. So um, so go back down to the down to the carburetors. Well, first of all, pull the choke cable all the way. No. Well, if you splay the end of it, tin it, solder it, so it can't it can't unfurl, you know, so it can't splay. Pull it out, pull it out of the out of the dash, and and then get the get the outer sheath as short as you possibly can. I mean, leave a little bit there, a little bit of extra, but as little as as little extra as, as you can and still have it fit the carburetors. Then go ahead and grease the cable, grease the inner cable and feed it back down through and, and make sure that when you grab the, you know, the, the, the rod that goes between the two brass levers to come off the carburetors, that that moves nice and easily. Well, again, spring tension. If you're not sure if it's moving easily, take the springs off the carburetors and then move it, it should move pretty easily. If it's stiff, pull it down, 
put some grease or something on the jet, some oil, and run that thing back and forth a hundred times until it until it's um, moving real easily, and then the choke will move easily. Okay, thank you for the suggestions. Okay, all right. I I, I just kind of keep moving here to get as many questions as, as I can. Jeffrey, um, Jeffrey De, De Magistris, uh 64B, I have a toggle switch on the top far left of the da dash. Is it overdrive? And if so, how does this work? Oh my, that's a long question. Jeffrey, are you still on here? Good, I'm not sure that I know for sure. Most of the overdrive switches on the 64Bs have a chrome thing around them that says overdrive on off. Um, and um, that switch, that switch works a relay and the relay in turn works the overdrive. So Jeffrey, if you're on and you can't hear, you can call me tomorrow. I'll talk to you more about it. Send you wire diagrams and tell you which wire is white and which wire is yellow and and where to fuse it and so forth, but I'm gonna keep going tonight. Uh, Randy, 72 MGB HIFs, runs good in cool weather. In very hot weather, it's unsta an unstable idle. Okay, so are you still on, Randy? This is a good one. Yeah, hey, yeah. John. Okay, all right, where, where are you from? I'm in Columbia, Ohio, a little south of Youngstown. Okay, all right, so, um, The unstable idle. I mean, I mean, there, there are four factors in the tune-up, right? Emissions, engine, ignition. Finally, there's fuel. So just because you've got an unstable idle doesn't mean necessarily it's a it's a it's carburetor problem. I mean, it probably is, but you got to make sure all those other four those other three things are taken care of first. So how when was the last time the carburetors were off and got rebuilt? Um, it's been a couple of years on the rebuild now. Okay. Um, All right. So take the suction chambers off, take the springs out, the air pistons off, take the take the, the the line that runs from the front of the front to the rear of the rear and goes over to the charcoal canister. Take oh, that off. That's the vent line to the to the float ball. Take a two foot long section of, of like three sixteenths hose, quarter inch hose. Put it on the, um, hey, I, I got a lot of background noise. I'm going to hit mute all here, um, but you can come back on, um, Randy, and uh, um, hook, that, hook that hose, that fresh hose, to the, to the fitting on the carburetor. And when you blow into it, puff into it, you'll get a stream of gasoline that comes up out of the main jet, two foot. I mean, it just, it's, it hardly takes any pressure at all to blow a lot of fuel out of that carburetor. So put your finger on the jet, blow into that tube as hard as you can till, till you see stars and make sure there's no gasoline burbling up out of the hole from the choke. What hole is that? Well, there's two holes behind the jet you operate the choke while you're blowing into it, you can see the gasoline burble off because the, the choke is on. Um, but there should be no gasoline, none, zero, none at all coming up out of that hole. If there is, the O-ring, which is on the choke, is, is leaking. And that will cause all kinds of trouble. So that's the first thing to check. Cheapest, easiest, simplest stuff first. So Randy, you still there? You can uh, unmute yourself. I was just getting some. Some uh, Randy, you're still muted. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here, John. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's okay. great. I mean, it's just it's a start. The next thing, the, the, the easy, easier than that is you take the 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 line off the off the carburetors. It goes to the charcoal canister, um, and that should not make one iota of difference. None. If it makes any difference at all, there's something going on inside the charcoal canister. It's plugged up, some, something's going on. So those are two things to check. Charcoal canister, simply by disconnecting the, the vent lines. And the next one is, is if that doesn't make any difference, take the suction chambers off and, and uh, see, see if you can get those things to, 
to uh, to leak. So Thank you, okay, you. where 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 are you? I'm in uh, Columbia, Ohio, just south of oh, you. You just you said that. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Okay, Judd, TD, MG, oh, okay, suddenly the TD runs horribly. Got it back to the shop, couldn't find any electrical or fuel supply problems, decided to balance the, the carbs, discovered that the S-link joining the carbs had broken. How bizarre is that? So there's l these little, I call them accordion-shaped uh, connectors, but S-connectors make sense too. There are these little accordion connectors that they got rid of. Um, when they went to the MGB, so Judd, that's 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 pretty good. So he's only wanting it was only running on one carburetor. So are you still on, Judd? Oh my gosh, Judd's off. He's always on early. My gosh, he, he, either he's he's off or he's walked away. So all right. So anyway, that's that's a pretty bizarre, um, good one. All right, and Bill Waterstrat is weighed in here, and he says, make sure you put the correct gasket on the oil pump. And this must be that that um, for the guy who couldn't come up with the oil pressure, the the cap on the oil pump is fitted flat to the body. There's no gasket there. There's no gasket between the oil pump and the cap of the oil pump. Um, it's real easy to think there should be. It looks like there should be. But there isn't. And if there is, you cannot get oil pressure. Thank you, Bill. I was, I was referring, John, to the gentleman that was rebuilding his MGB engine when well, he was he, putting the oil pump back on. You have the two different gaskets depending on the year of the MGB engine. Okay, right. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, that is that is the most common reason on an MGB engine why you can't get oil pressure. And that that is that is it. Um, it's getting the wrong gasket in there. It's so easy to get the wrong gasket. Yeah, yeah, just saw that. I see that all all the time. I do, I do. I I wish they, I wish they they were <clears throat> more clear in the in the instructions. I wish the oil pumps that they provided weren't cut away for the for the Austin Maxi engine, which no one has anymore. Uh, it's 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 uh, anyway. Okay, Bill, Bill's from the Greater Chicago area, or or you were? Are you still there? Oh yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> where, but you're not in Chicago. Nobody lives in Chicago. You're in where? I'm in Oak Lawn, but I'm part time oh. in Michigan now too. So. Oh, hey, great. Okay, all right. Okay, thanks a lot, Bill. Thanks, Pat. G to everybody. I've got an SU question. I'm replacing the plastic dampener on a set of TD carburetors. I have br I have a brass cap damper, but no vent hole. Should I drill one? Yes. That's that's the answer. Yes. You have to have one hole, you can't have none, and you can't have two, or else the Thanks, car John. Will... Yeah, you're, you're there. Okay, Pat, where's Pat G? Here I am, San Diego. Oh, where, where are you from? San Diego. Who just wrote me from San Diego and invited me to come out to a tech seminar? Was that you? Oh, you're you're always welcome, John. Could have been uh, me. I'm a I'm a um, I'm an honorary member of the San Diego MG MG Car Club. I am great. A um, life member from when I came out in 2010. Yep, and went to uh, 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 D passed away. Um, who's you were at uh, MG's at the Bay? Yes. Yep. And nobody so, attended my tech session because I was at the same time as you. Uh oh. <laughs> so I had no attendance. Well, three people. Okay. Anyway, yes, you got to have a hole in, in that damper. Absolutely. All right. I will do it. Thanks, John. Okay. Janet and Reg joined the meeting late. Well, that's all right. We've gone late. Um, however, I was wondering if you can tell if needles are worn and if you need oversized jets. Oversized jets would give you way too rich of a mixture. So what you probably mean is undersized jets. Undersized. No, that's, that's not. Oh, you're, you're on. Yeah, okay. still on. And in, in you're Reg. Yeah. You're, you, you don't look like Janet. So, okay. Where, where are you calling from? 
Vancouver, John. Oh, Vancouver, all right. So you really can't tell if the needles are worn unless you have spring-loaded needles. What year is your car? 58 MGA. Yeah, you can't tell if the needles are worn um, because the, 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 the spring-loaded needles, you can see a shiny, a shiny part to them where they're always rubbing against the jet. But how long has it been since your carburetors have been rebuilt, do you think? Well, we put them back together about six months ago, but they've been in a box for 20 years. So how many how many miles do you think they had on them the, the way that they were? Uh, probably 10,000 miles. They don't need to be. No, they're, you're, you're all right. They don't need. Uh, if you got a problem, then you got to solve it some other way. But the jets and needles are probably OK. They're good for. Oh, my gosh. I, I, I mean. 100,000 miles, they're, they're good for a long, long, they don't wear. I mean, that all that gasoline coming out of the jet wears the jet, just like the water going over Niagara Falls causes the, <laughs> causes the Niagara Falls to recede. But, oh my God, I mean, it just takes miles and miles and miles to do that kind of damage um, to them. Okay. So. No, that's great. Just wondered if there was a measurement or anything. No, None that I can come up with, no, no. Thanks very much, John. Hey, thank you. All right, next one, Scott Lynn. A heated manifold with a Weber does help a lot. Yes, it does. Uh, Scott Lynn, if you're on, come on. Um, but the uh, the problem with the downdraft Weber is the is the air, the air fuel goes down, hits the bottom of the manifold, does a 90 degree, comes out, hits a 90 degree, and goes into the engine. And at idle, the air isn't moving fast enough to keep all that gasoline and, and air in suspension. So the gasoline falls out of suspension, puddles on the bottom side of the manifold. And when you hit the throttle, it sucks all this extra gas in, uh, except for the gentleman I talked to before. And he, isn't ha he doesn't have that problem. I had that problem really badly before I added the heat to the manifold. Okay. All right. Well, once you get the heat to the manifold, then the walls aren't so aren't aren't. aren't you wrap electrical wire around it and and put, plug it in, or how, how did you heat the manifold? I uh, just run the heater through it. Okay. The the the, the I come out of the uh, out of the heater in my midget, and then run it through under there, and then okay. it returns. So I just put it into the normal system. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, that that does so much. It does so much to help it out. Uh, Triumphs do the same thing. I think a TR fours may, maybe, and certainly all this all the Spitfires do, and the Midget fifteen hundred does. They got a they got a, a, a tube that goes right through the manifold and always keeps it warm. So yeah, Scott, if it, if I didn't have this, it would make it pretty much undrivable until it really warms up like okay. you know 20 minutes of driving or something oh and that'd be gosh. okay oh my gosh okay where where are you from scott uh oregon corvallis okay. all right yeah i've been to corvallis at the M mgb meet there and what yeah yeah 2012 maybe no i don't mean yeah 2012 when when well, corvallis was a while ago yeah it was a while ago yep you had a real good time there. Oh my gosh. So, okay, I, I'd hang on and talk more about Corvallis, but I, I got to move on. Doug, I live in Chicago. All right. Okay. Ben Andrews, uh, quick recap. So, the test for the HIF O rings is you blow into the float chamber, a port, the vent to add pressure. Yes, that's it. Yes. Um, ben, are you still on, Ben? Did you hang on this far? Yeah. Yeah, I just. Don't know if I have a microphone. But in Chicago, it's already 847. You're not you're not in Chicago. You're in Valpo, right? Yep. So anyway, you, you had a microphone for a second anyway, but you're on mute again, Ben. But anyway, so yes, on the HIF carburetors, you take the you, you take the line off that goes over the charcoal canister, put a line on there, blow into it, pressurizes the float bowl. The gasoline shoots up out of the jet. You do that to begin with without an incandescent bulb hanging there or to catch to catch all the gasoline on fire. Just to make sure you go, yeah, okay, I get it. I'm pressurizing the fuel. I'm in the right, the right thing. And then put your finger on the jet 
and blow so hard you see stars. Don't use air pressure off your air compressor. You'll blow your carburetors apart. But, um, but, but uh, with a finger on the jet and blow so hard, and if any gasoline burbles up out of there, it's too much. You got to take it off and replace the O-ring on the, on the rotary choke with a number 13 Viton O-ring. Okay. Right. Thank you. I'm hey, glad to have you back. I am at the end of chat. We got there, but it's 948, so we've gone a little bit longer than, than we usually do. Doug Clark, are you on? I, I haven't seen I haven't seen you on, I haven't seen your name on here, but Doug Clark. Yes, yes John. What number, what number did we reach today? At 204. 204. Oh my gosh. That's bigger than what well, you know. That's because we're talking about SUs. That's why. That's why 204. So next time we do this, I mean, my next my next Zoom session, which is going to be help me out. It probably isn't going to be yet this year, is it? Uh, no, because it's the 26th. But next month, um, we're dealing with. Oh, let's go with the ninth and the twenty third, something like that. I'm I'm not going to get Fred on the ninth because because we've just done this. Use so we'll do something else, but maybe they're around the twenty third. I think those dates are about right. I'm going to get Fred on again to talk more about issues because it's really popular, and Fred's got this wonderful, wonderful classification system that he's worked so hard over what Fred twenty years of 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 looking at cars and and the carburetors to come up with this code system that you've discovered? A big, a big collection of used carbs. Yeah. A big collection. So um, matter of fact, what I could do, what I could do is I could put Fred's, uh, all the, you, you're, you're, pretty, you're, you're pretty straight on all this stuff now, right? You, do, you, do you need more data? Uh, I, well, I can always, you know, update it if if something new comes in, you know. Well, maybe what I'll do is put Fred's email in the next in the next one and have everybody look at the carburetors on their own car with a build date and uh, and, uh you know, with the excellent Fred, you can send me what you need. I, I know what you need, but you send me what you need, and sure. and I'll I'll put that out in the in the next constant contact. And uh, anyway, so around the twenty, around whatever the number that was, the twenty third. Um, we'll, we'll get Fred back, back on and, and uh, talk about uh, SU carburetors again, because they're so popular. Nothing else is as popular as SU carburetors. So it's I'm doing absolutely like, amazing. I'm doing a paper on the uh, Austin Healy Sprite, you know, the small uh, Austin Healy's, and also on the big Austin Healy's, two separate papers. And I did one on the T-Series already uh, from 36 to 55. I'm going okay. to do one on the MMMs and then one on the MGBs. Very nice. Okay. Well, we'll see if we can get you some more some more data prior to that. So, so. Well, anyway, so that's it. That's uh, that's it. I I would invite uh, if you're anywhere um, in Western Michigan and you want to come to the University Motors 48th birthday party. I just talked to um, uh, my assistant today, Marty, and I said, well, you know. Really, the first time I, I used the name University Motors was a DBA in 1973. So maybe this should be my 50th birthday party. And isn't that fascinating because MG is celebrating its 100th anniversary in 2023. So that means I've been with MG for half of their life and most of my, <laughs> most of my life. Um, but I really date University Motors from the 25th of January, 1975, which is when, after being discharged from my last job, um, that's a kind way of putting it, um, I, I, said, I said, I'm not going to work for somebody else again. I'm going to work for myself. And so that's what I did in 1975. And so I date my University Motors from then, even though I had a DBA. Actually, I ran University Motors as a DBA doing business as single proprietorship until 1980, around 88, when we became a class C corporation. Oh boy. 
and then had to fill out all the federal paperwork and so forth. But that worked. And then I, I collapsed that when, in, in 2016, at the end of 2016, when I, when I closed out of the shop. And now I just, I, just, um, I just applied for a passport. In 1962, that was my first time that I went to England, 1962 with the Boy Scouts of America. And I got to stay there for a month. Um, my first host had a had an MG, as a matter of fact, but it made no impact on on me at all. I, I think it was a I think it was a TC. Um, and um, anyway, that whole trip, I was gone for a month. It cost my parents two hundred and fifty dollars. Now the trip, in part, was underwritten by the Gillette Razor Blade Company. And I felt guilty for years because I, I, I didn't shave. I just ran into some people the other day at the Rochester at the Rochester um, Christmas party who said, oh, my God, I didn't recognize you. You don't have a beard. My late wife, Caroline, never saw me without a beard. But in, anyway, um, I went to England in 1962 for a month. Cost my parents 250 bucks. I just went to get my passport. And that cost me well over, well, of course, because I waited and I had to have it expedited because I'm going to England in February to an MG Car Club event, which includes a, a, a um, reunion of University Motors employees from the original University Motors. So that's going to be a, a lot of fun. But I had to put down on there my occupation. So I put down consultant. <laughs> I, again, I guess I've been consulting on MGs certainly since 19, um, 1971. I first got paid. I first got paid to work um, on an MG in 1971. So that's when my real date of entry is. I've been an owner since 68. And um, I've used the name University of Motors in 73, but I haven't been open as University of Motors, trading as University of Motors full time, and I am no longer, but since uh, January 25th, 1975. So anyway, long story to get to my 48th birthday party at the Hilton Hotel down by the airport in Grand Rapids, if you've been to it before, just a fun time to come by and say hi, you know. As long as it's not snowing too badly, you know, we had so many uh, university motors and the whole culture that surrounded that. It was so much fun. Um, we had um, birthday parties. We never had any births at any event. We did have weddings. We had we had one one wedding, and then at the last minute, another guy tagged along and got married on the same on the same day, but. Uh, Sherry Smith uh, got married at, at our at our um, at one of our parties, one of our summer parties. Everything shut down for for a minute, and well, longer than a, a minute. And um, then later on that that uh, that night, Dennis Trowbridge got married, and we also had a funeral. Go figure. We had a funeral at my shop. Um, we had a, a, a lo local club member, longtime member. And um, the word went around that he died. And like the next day, I get a phone call and, and this gal calls up and says, well, you know, um, uh, you probably don't know me, but you, you knew my dad, you know, and he just died. And I said, yeah. She said, I got a real unusual request. And I said, well, yes. She said, well, how, how do you know what I was going to ask? And I said, well, your dad died yesterday and you have an unusual request. You want to have you want to have the funeral here at the shop? And I said, sure. So anyway, we've, we've had a lot of fun at the shop. Weddings, funerals. I mean, how much fun can a funeral be? But um, birthday parties, summer parties, all kinds of stuff. So anyway, we're, we've got another birthday party coming up. Haven't had one in too many years, an official one. So th th this will be fun. It'll be nice to see people from from here and there and everywhere. Um, anyway, it's all but 10 o'clock. Oh my gosh, a three hour run here and we're down to 58 people. So I gotta say, I, I gotta say good night. Of, the, of all the 58, a couple of them have to be asleep. I bet, <laughs> I bet. If, if Thank I you, John. Around, uh, hey, Merry I, Christmas, John.
Hey, Merry Christmas Thanks, to everybody. Fred. Thanks for hanging on. And Fred, thank you for, for being here. And I need your phone number. And uh, send me an email. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, this is this is great. So we, we, we learned a few things tonight. Good. Very Good. informative. That's thank you. Very Merry informative. Christmas. Hey, John, did you did you get the calendar we sent yet? I, I haven't been out to the mailbox in three days. <laughs> I, 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 just, I, I just got back from Rochester, but it's probably out in the mail, all curled up and, and full. <laughs> and, and wet. <laughs> and, well, no, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't it, say that. It no. might, uh, it, because of the, 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 the Christmas season, it could take a while. Okay, thank you. Thank you very kindly. Bob, Bob and Gloria put out a, a calendar um, that's a, a MG calendar, and it's more often than not a picture of their car. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's their calendar, right? Um, it's this, this year, strong, only two. <laughs> posed, posed, and lots of lots of different positions in front of in front of uh, uh, iconic vacation places. You know, and, uh, you know, and they travel all over. How many miles you got on that car? Five hundred twenty uh, now. Uh, about almost five hundred nine thousand. Five hundred nine thousand. Excuse yeah. me, I grossly exaggerated. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> but it may have six hundred, but I don't count what I don't know. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, okay. But anyway, thanks everybody for being on tonight. It's been it's been wild, you know, unadulterated, unfiltered. So yeah, yeah. No all no right, bad language. <laughs> no bad language tonight. So anyway, hey, thanks everybody for being here. Go. To, I forgot yeah. to make any mention that of my website but you know gosh you know i appreciate those those contributions very much i, I really i really do um and um anyway look forward to seeing everybody um in january absolutely so see you Merry christmas thank you john good night. Merry christmas. Good night. Good night. Texas, john. Yeah. good night thank you, john. Oh, oh wait john. short three hours doug 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 before you go there we go. John, before, before, John, before you go. <laughs> okay. I have, uh, pins, MG, Morgan, Triumph, and Wolseley and, uh, surrounding. The Very nice. This this belonged to uh, this one belonged to my late wife's grandfather. And it, you probably can't read it on, on the inside, but it's it's a uh, it's absolutely it's original. Made, yeah. in, made in Barbados or someplace, you know. He was yeah. an officer in the British Army. So, yep, yep. So, I have to wear my sombrero next time. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not sure Doug and I can, can match sombreros, but we... John, I'm not sure we would want to. <laughs> it's a big, but, heavy thing. <laughs> but we can, we can match, uh, we can, we, we can match. <laughs> Pith helmets until we get mad and start pithing on each other. So yeah, yeah. 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 All right, John. Okay. Thanks for Christmas. Merry Christmas to everybody. Hey, Rodolfo, Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad, <laughs> Rodolfo. Yes. You okay. too. Thanks a lot, everybody. Okay. Hey, good Merry to see Christmas, you, Rodolfo. everybody. Have a great time. Hi. Merry I'll wear my sombrero just for you, Rodolfo. Ah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> Next time. Okay. Francis, nice to Bruce see you. Um, Barney, did, didn't hear from Bar Barney. We didn't hear from you at all. I, I don't see your face. But, uh, uh, yeah. I'm still sitting here. It's my camera's wacky tonight. Okay. All right. Yep. Gosh. Okay. All right. Make sure if you're if you got MGA questions, go on Barney's site, mgaguru.com. It's got four thousand plus pages of of more information than you need is free. Um, when I start my website on the mostly mostly MGV stuff, it isn't going to be free. It's got a subscription. So Barney's is a better deal so far. Uh, how many of us are still left? Pardon? How many of us are still online? Um, uh, we had 200 tonight. We had two. I wrote it down. Where did I write it? It was 204. 204? Or now 24. That's great numbers. Congratulations to to close the year. Hey, yeah, it is. It's great. It's great. Absolutely. Yeah. You, right. you know what? What is my New Year's purpose? My what I want to do next year, 2023. 
I will import an MGA <laughs> to Monterrey. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I totally, I'm committed to the MG. <laughs> hey. Very nice. Very nice. Wonderful. Now, there's lots of, lots of people here who can help you with the MGA stuff. So, great. Yep. Nice car. <laughs> Thanks a lot. See you guys. Oh, okay. Bye. All right. Jack Kurkowski. Oh, my gosh. Jack's on. So, oh, man. Yep. Jack's still on. Yep. Oh, yep. my gosh. Now, I've been meaning to come down to Indianapolis and see Bob Connell, and I just haven't got there. And tick, tick, tick. You know, maybe on my way down to Alabama th this year or so. So, anyway. See. All right. Well, anyway, everybody, thank you very much. See and, you next uh, year. Good night. <laughs> Ah, absolutely. Okay. All right. See you, John. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Good night. Good night.